Dr. Alex Knesvik. What's up, my brother? How are you, my man? I'm so pumped for this. We, we made it. We made it. We're ready to go. Yes, we did. We did. And thanks to Evan Bliss for making the introduction happen. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I appreciate, uh, appreciate the invite. Yeah. And I love everything that you do in ophthalmology. I'm so fascinated by the eye. I'm so fascinated by what it gives us as sentient creatures in our environment. And we definitely do not give it the gratitude and the appreciation that it deserves. And especially those that uh, that take really good care of our eyes for us that have went through the medical literature to mm -hmm. know what to do. It's a long road. It's a long road. And, you know, I we, we've gotten a chance to talk about a lot of this uh, w without other people sharing. So uh, so I'm glad that we can we could do this in a setting where uh, where, where other people can can partake. Yeah. I love starting things off as we sort of get into the nitty gritty of what exactly the unpacking of things like cataracts are and LASIK is and all this type of stuff. I like to start things off with our guests asking them about their thoughts on some of the more bigger picture questions about the nature of our reality and the nature of consciousness in general. And I'm pretty excited to hear how you think about these things. So the first question is, why does reality exist? Why does reality exist? <laughs> uh, we'll add this to the uh, cheat sheet that wasn't given pre-screening. Uh, reality, it does exist and we need it. Um, let's see. Let me, let me massage this through, you know, so, so if I took you through undergrad and medical school training and, and, and residency and fellowship and said, you know, what bells does that, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of bells that have been built over the years. Uh, and what, what bells does that ring? Why does reality exist? Well, we need it. Right. We need uh, we need to live in a reality. We need to c create structure um, and uh, a construct that we can operate within. Ooh, I like that answer. No, no, no pun intended. I like that answer. Yeah. As in, we need to create these realities for us to embed ourselves in as explorations. I like using that word a lot in my like metaphysics nomenclature is that we undergo an exploration through this reality. And we sort of use consciousness and awareness as a as a way to experience the realities mm -hmm. <laughs> what would you say then is also the 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 like this one specifically appears to be so elusive to the majority of us which is the very fact of being aware or the very fact of being sentient or conscious in itself just that very fact maybe a good way to talk about it is pre-coloration so before all of your emotions and feelings and thoughts and layers of identity of who you are and your relationship to objects before all of that pre-coloration, just the very fact that you have awareness is extremely profound. And that's sort of what we talk about regarding self-realization on the program. How does that resonate with you? How do you approach that? I 
think you know in um so something that I think about a lot uh it, is that you know there are some of these is ways that will uh, structure our value system, right? Um, and if we if we cycle into you know particularly in, in in the hard sciences, you know where where things aren't as held as in in as high of a regard um, of uh, you know the arts and and culture and uh, you know music and you know some of these uh, the 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 softer things about society uh you know as you go through some of the training programs you know some of those things aren't as uh they're not pushed as much right um but i think that you find that societies that function the best need those things right because you need you need to ask some of these questions to give you the why because the the what and the how are are easier questions to answer you know but but the why is is a little more elusive to answer and i think you find those in some of these in, in some of these genres yeah it's a great way to put it as well that the we can almost create a juxtaposition between some of these more harder sciences, especially in the sense of mathematics or physics, and especially physicalism itself. And then we can sort of juxtapose that. And you can add biology and chemistry and neuroscience and all the others to that as well. And we can sort of juxtapose that with something that's maybe art and music and philosophy and the humanities and metaphysics. And when you sort of combine those two, that's where I've found the most integral or holistic agents to interact with. They get it at a deeper level than people that are siloed in either one of those. Mm -hmm. And anyone that realizes the point of art or the point of music especially knows that when it creates a feeling, especially something that may trigger someone else to have more well-being or to be more awakened, that can be seen as potentially a piece of art that has a greater amount of of salience to it and in this case in science it can be similar where you create something that in the absolute worst pole can be something like nuclear weapons or bio warfare or malevolent agi and on the absolute best pole you can create something that eradicates poverty that provides clean water in abundance mm -hmm. to the majority of civilization so the synthesis of those two has been such a key principle of my life and also of the lives of many of the greatest people that i've been able to sit down with on on the program i'm glad you brought that up as well we'll be revisiting consciousness and the nature of being in general as we talk how did when you were figuring out what is your north star is your self-actualization so the self-realization is the realization that we were talking about earlier of that that god that source that we are and then the self-actualization is sort of the expression of that into mm -hmm. the world and us being unique expressions of it as these individual conscious agents in that so you got to figure out what that was for you mm -hmm. and how did it hone in over time on 
ophthalmology? Well, I, you know, I think one of the most beautiful things about medicine is that it is not an exact science, right? It, it is, in its purest sense, a, a blend of the science and the art, right? So, you know, a lot of what you do as, as a physician, uh, as, a, as a surgeon, when, when you interact with patients, uh, when you do, you, you perform these, these procedures, you know, there, there is a, a lot of art in the work, Right. So I, you know, and, and I think for that reason, you know, you, you find that a lot of physicians, they get, um, they, they feel a lot of, uh, satisfaction out of their work because there's, there is this expression in it, right? It's not, um, and, you know, it, it, and I think we, we've actually spoken about this before, you know, when you look at, uh, like the concept of flow, right? And like the flow mind state and, you know, things, that, that give people this experience where, you know, you're so engrossed in, in, a, uh, in, in an action, in something where you lose all track of time, you're, you're totally focused on this thing. Um, and, you know, the great joy that people experience in flow, uh, you know, the, uh, in, it, the, the, the guy, um, it's a University of Chicago uh, psychology professor, uh, Mihaly. We, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, the, yeah, that, uh, yeah. Um, yeah you know the the book is phenomenal but uh you know his last name continues continues <laughs> to elude, elude me yeah. yeah the uh, um, austrian i believe and uh you know when, when you look at some of the rules for for flow and some of the the actions that tend to predispose someone to experiencing this this profound experience that people you know talk about whether they're uh you know uh, uh it, rock climbers i think are you know, uh, one of the ones that uh, you know when he goes through you know people that experience a lot of flow they're the people in athletics people um that in these high skill activities uh one of the fields that he continues to go back to over the course of the entire book uh, is surgeons um because so you know there there are so many aspects that are pro uh, flow, you know, this flow experience that you're totally engrossed in this, um, in this thing that you're doing. Um, and, and I can tell you that, you know, you, you look at, uh, you know, studies on a lot of longtime surgeons and they talk about how, you know, they get so much enjoyment out of the work, they would do it for free. Um, you know, the, the, the act of the, the work is that powerful. Um, so then you add on top of that, you know, the layer of what you're able to do for the patients, what you're able to do for society, what you're able to do for your community. Um, you know, I, I think that I knew some of those things going in, um, but now being on the other side of it, uh, it's, it's powerful. You know, it's really powerful. I, uh, I, I, I find myself experiencing that in my work uh, on a daily basis. Ooh, I love that. I love how you went to, into flow and I love how you give the example that we just came from, which is the synthesis of that art and science mm -hmm. as what in this case is what you feel as you undergo the process of being in service to helping augment people's lives. And yeah, the amount of in these scenarios, just like here with interviewing, it's so important to completely be present. And that same mm -hmm. thing in athletics, it's the same thing in surgery. Mm -hmm. You cannot be thinking about the past. Mm -hmm. You cannot be thinking about the future. You have to be there and ensuring that what you're doing is of peak performance. And also that you're scientifically, you're following a methodological procedural system LASIK, cataract, any of these scenarios. Yet, as we've had many physicians on the program, and even some as my personal mentors, have talked to me about how the art is actually so critical as you undergo this methodological protocol. Mm -hmm. Because you're going to encounter so many times something that needs that that happens off protocol that mm -hmm. and you're gonna have to improvise well and and that's actually something i find um was the biggest transition for me going from training to you know trainee to 
uh, completing training and now being kind of out on my own in private practice, you know, when you're in med school, you take you take a lot of bubble tests, right? And bubble tests have A, B, C, and D, right? And you can you can find the right there is an answer, and the answer is A, B, C, or D. Um, but when you get out, um, you know, and you have this patient in front of you, you have this problem in front of you, um, sometimes it's not any of those four. Um, and you still you still have to make a call. You still have to make a judgment call. Um, and that's that's where the experience comes in. That's where the mentorship comes in. Um, that's where the art comes in. Uh, and, and I think that that's that's kind of the fun part. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. That's that's a huge part of the fun. And then I would also assume that from so many of the conversations that we've had, that there's something that's this is very similar with what I get from the program as well in the sense of my goodness when the guest leaves at the end of the program and it's just like wow like I really blossomed on the program thank you for that you know it's similar with when you heal someone when mm-hmm. you augment someone's life when they have something that's a pathology that's formed in their eye right. that, that satisfaction they, that you get exactly yeah yeah because then they're like thank you so much doctor thank you because it's the vision my goodness man you you had that hilarious little instagram post that you had recently made for thanksgiving where (laughs) there was a little flying turkey inside of the eye for cataracts in this case um and i still think it's funny it's it is funny. Yeah, I it's, still think it's funny. But, it, but like, if you can try and empathize and imagine the, let's see, we actually have the, we have the numbers, we have the numbers right here. Um, so, cataract surgery is the most common procedure performed by the ophthalmic surgeon this year. Three point six million cataract procedures will be performed in the United States and more than 20 million will be performed worldwide. So the number of patients visually handicapped by cataract globally increases every year. So the reason why I bring this up is because before you know it, it's going to be happening to your parents or you know, down line, you mm-hmm. and me. And so to sort of have an idea of like this vision that we have right now that we're so, you know, the body it being in such good health, it's like we just no problem go about the day. But as soon as we have some sort of ailment in our like knee or our lower back or especially in our vision, if we had that little fuzzy opaqueness mm-hmm. forming in this pocket of our vision, it's disastrous once the health de- deteriorates like that. And we just want to rebound as quickly as we can. Well, and it's a, it's a uh, it hits deep, right? It hits deep because it starts to make us question um, you know, our own mortality, right? And, you know, what, you know, how, how, how many days do we have here? Is this, are things starting to change for me? Um, and, you know, and I obviously don't, don't know your, your medical history, but, you know, I've had certain, you know, I've gotten sick before I've had surgeries before. Um, you know, I, I, I had LASIK myself. Uh, so, you know, to be in a position where, you know, I do this procedure, I know exactly how it's supposed to go. I know exactly how the post-op period goes. I know exactly how everything, how, how everything should go. And, you know, and it's still scary, you know, and it's, it, it's still scary to be um, on the other side of that where now, you know, you're, you're the patient. Um, and, you know, I, I think that that's, that's actually been one of the most powerful experiences for me to have been on both ends. Right. Because I, I, yeah. I think it now, you know, there there are some things that I think you, you have to experience yourself to really be able to connect with people. on, um, And, uh, you know, I, I think that that's been one of the most powerful things for me, uh, as, you know, as a physician, as a surgeon to to have been 
to have experienced some of those things so that now when I when I see you know my patients and and the trust that people put in me uh, you know to know to know what that felt like it's cool that you got LASIK and that enabled you to have that perspective that you now have it's actually really important in a sense for the person that's undergoing the the surgery in this case maybe it's me that's undergoing the surgery to know that the physician the surgeon in the case has been through this procedure as a patient themselves so that they know what it looks like before during after Mm -hmm. and they know like you're dealing with a lot of the different combinations and iterations of what each individual person undergoes with Mm -hmm how they feel about the entire process. And so now you're becoming more agile and you have a greater Mm -hmm. catalog of people's responses in undergoing this process that you can navigate more swiftly. And that's, that's super duper important. Well, and I, and I think um, just to touch back on the, uh, the art part, you know, I think that, also becomes a part of the the shepherding right you know where you know you are there to not just perform a procedure right but you know we are we are not robots right we're not automatons um, but you're you're performing a procedure on a person who's going to feel some sort of way about this procedure yep. um, and you know you are being entrusted not just with their surgery and in performing well, but also being able to shepherd, you know, that, that emotional journey for them because it's stressful time. Right. Um, and you know, I, I think that the, how you interact with that person, how you, you make them, you make sure that they feel heard, you make sure that they feel like they can trust you. Yep. Um, you know, so many of those things can make this experience, you know, go very positively and become, you know, an extremely, you know, a a liberating experience where you come in with a problem and you find somebody that you trust, that you connect with, they're able to fix this problem and you can go off on the road, you you know, you continue to go off on your own Um, or or something that becomes more scary, right? And you don't have the right person there to to kind of shepherd you through this. Um, and you know, I, I keep going back to the the, the trust thing, but I, I think yeah. that it's uh, it, it's so it's so important. Lumped into art, in a sense, we could add emotional intelligence. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, and that's what this is. It's yeah. it's the ability to navigate all of the different expressions of humans that are coming in to undergo these surgical processes, mm-hmm. because if you can navigate them with love and peace and joy and compassion and wisdom my goodness the whole process see this is the type of stuff that i love is that you know that's why you're here is because you see it from a scientific and an artistic perspective Mm -hmm. and i think it's very important to help hopefully bring into the hearts of others not only that are physicians currently and that are aspiring physicians is picking up that emotional intelligence picking up that art along the way that spirituality along the way as you dive into the science is going to be super critical and i love the way that you also explained it like a b c d well what about when the off protocol experience comes you know is the is maybe there should be more practice we've we've talked about this before but and we'll we'll get into this in more detail but sort of you know what does the future of physician education actually look like is mm-hmm. there going to be a module for a deeper module for emotional intelligence and art and spirituality is there going to be a module for the the ability to sort of go beyond the existing infrastructures. Maybe it's something like tool making, like tool making itself as a module. Like maybe that is something that becomes something that is really powerful because how often does out of the 450 ophthalmologists that are 
graduating every single year in the United States, how many of them are thinking, well, how can I build something that is potentially better than LASIK or the existing solving of the issues with cataract? Mm -hmm. Could I actually push the edge of ophthalmology that's never been done before. But like, when are we trained to be that style of thinkers in medical school would be a question. Yeah. Well, and even, um, you know, if you think about medical training um, and even medicine as a culture, like, right, it's not tech, right? Like, like it's it's not right, tech right it's go. not it's it's, it's not, not silicon valley iterative right yeah pool tables and 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 kitchens full of yeah snacks from right. your vegan local and and i would actually say that you know i think what what is going to be interesting moving forward is as tech companies are getting involved in medicine yeah right google is starting to get involved in medicine and Calico. you know uh, yeah. right and as as some of these uh, these other approaches philosophically, right? These, these different philosophical approaches to solving problems um, start to get involved in the field. Uh, I'm I'm curious. I would say that I'm I'm curious to see how things go because you know I think if you look at physicians, um, you know, on a sweeping generalization, right? On a sweeping generalization, a lot of physicians. You know, and what I think that the field is selected for is not or is not people that are inherently risk takers, like right. Yeah. You know, so you yep. know, because like right, do you do you want your physician to be a risk taker, right? You know, so so there are there are some there are some characteristics that you know if you were to look at things that are that are good for innovation, you know, sometimes aren't. W wouldn't align with building an entire infrastructure of, of medical doctors, right? So, you know, how how you um, play at two of these poles, right? Where on one end, you know, you want to be progressive and you want to innovate and you want to try new things, you know, on the other end of that pole, you know, you I don't know if you want somebody necessarily coming in and just trying some new procedure on you that you know wasn't well studied that's why we have the fda that's why we have all this stuff um you know speaking of uh, I, I think i'm going to be getting vaccine uh this week uh which is which is exciting um you know I, I think it's it's kind of a medical marvel if you really look at what uh, what happened over the course of the last year and now here we are uh, you know in, in all honesty I, I actually you know after spending all this time in medicine am, am surprised myself that uh, that that this w you know that they were able to, to pump this thing out before um, before the end of the year I think it's it's really you know a testament to how far you know medicine has come and what uh, what we're able to create so you know that I uh, slightly unrelated but uh, I, I just remember that I have that coming up tomorrow something that would be great would be just a brief small hit back on that ball would be just like keeping the general public in a loop about the actual iterative process that science has undergone with creating the vaccine on a very video log level. So creating video logs of the actual process and the actual ability of the vaccine to create the solution that tackles the coronavirus and making it actually building truly going through the hard process of building the trust it's a hard process like you said that you kept going back to trust it's the it's that main thing on just a small on a small point there mm -hmm. there's a lot of aspects to these like next generation you gave the two poles, which are great. We need them both. Yet, we need visionaries 
really more than ever we need visionaries and a lot of the existing collegiate and university infrastructures are in a sense very much like a straitjacket and that is beneficial in some ways and it's detrimental in others and the hybridization of the information technology smartphones virtual reality era is coming it's already very much here with being able to become an autodidact and teach yourself from the internet which is incredible but that's creating a whole economic process for the education sector that it's never experienced before because it's always been a gatekeeper in many ways and it's no longer and same thing in media we have this now which there's no longer a gatekeeper this is it this is it. it's a democratized technology that's now here it's meritocracy meritocracy those with the most competence should be the ones that ideally are the ones that are aiming to help lead the world in tackling the biggest challenges and maximizing well-being will you rank order for us i want the rank order in ophthalmology the first principle in a sense that again we very quickly forget the profundity of is that you want to retain the health of the eye in its peak capacities mm -hmm. and then now would we say that ideally you would want to do something potentially like you know retain what your the capacity of your eyes are like when you're you know maybe 18 years old like the 18 year old eye and you want to basically keep that mm -hmm. through your 20s 30s 40s 50s 60s 70s 80s and beyond like having that even even 10 years i'm 28 now over the last 10 years oh my goodness has my eyesight deteriorated in so many ways i used i used to be able to sit at the back of the class or the presentation and have mm -hmm. no problem with watching what was being presented now i either have to sit in the middle and squint really hard or i have to sit all the way in the front row which i like doing anyway to actually be able to see it so there's sort of a deterioration plus with the era of these devices our our focal range in itself has become you know if this is even 12 inches or mm -hmm. something 12 or 24 maybe inches mm -hmm. and that and or the computer screens when we're working for eight hours you know sitting and looking at something that's two well, feet from us and longer right and you know because because yeah. it's yeah. you know you're you're on your phone in the morning eight hours at work then you go home and you're <laughs> on your phone at home and you're scrolling through instagram yeah. uh and uh so yeah i mean uh screen time is uh is up and it's up in a big way and i don't know that it's going anywhere right um you know the uh you know it, it as you mentioned you know the so, so a couple, uh, a couple things start to happen as we get older, right? Um, so uh, we already kind of touched on, touched on cataracts a little bit. So, so when we look inside, inside the eye, there's this natural lens. You're born with this lens. It comes in clear. This is a good time uh, to bring up some of the visuals. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, excellent. Throw. Let's, let's bring up those visuals. That's, uh, yeah, I think it's okay. this, this one yeah, right yeah. here, this one. Right, right. Okay, cool. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, right. oh, this one's dope. Right. I'm so excited for you guys. All right. Yeah. Check that out. 
So right. we got a healthy lens so, so, on the left and a yeah, lens with so, cataracts on the right. right. So on our on our left side, so that, that's our eye and cross-section. Um, and if you look inside the eye, uh, you have you have this healthy lens. So, you know, when you look at someone's eyes and you see their eye color, that's their iris. So you blue eyes, green eyes, something like that. Um, so that's your iris color. Behind the iris is where that lens sits. And as we get older, UV related changes, age related changes, all the fibers in that lens start to change their, their orientation and light doesn't pass through them as well. So as light doesn't pass through them as well, it becomes cloudy. It's almost like, uh, like driving a car with a dirty windshield. Um, and sometimes the windshield can get so dirty you can't see out of it at all. Um, and, uh, and that's a cataract. And so, so, you know, as cataracts begin to develop, they impact your vision. And, um, you know, sometimes there, there, there's a host of reasons why cataracts develop, but usually they're age related. Usually, you know, um, I'm kind of speaking in general terms, but we're talking 60s, 70s or so when um, this starts to really kind of impact your vision. There's some exceptions. Um, you know, if you were on uh, prednisone, you're on steroids for asthma, COPD, something like that, trauma, um, you know, there, there's some times where, uh, and sometimes even congenital cataracts there's some babies that are born with cataracts um, but uh, really there's a fix for this so we go in we actually make a little hole on the front side the cataract actually sits inside of a little bag um, we make a hole on the front side of that bag we take the cataract out and then put a new lens inside of the bag um, and uh, and it, it, it's kind of crazy. So if you if you look at the backstory on that, um, so back in uh, back in World War II, uh, so these these lenses are made out of a, a particular plas plastic, this like PMMA, um, and sort of offshoot of plastic. And uh, during World War II, there were some fighter pilots um, that the uh, the windshields on their fighter jets had uh, had shattered, and little fragments of this this plastic, the same plastic. Um, fell into their eyes and they found that there was no inflammatory response. You know, their eyes handled the plastic just fine. It was just kind of hanging out in there. So that was actually how the, the first intraocular lenses were made out of that same material. Um, so now, you know, it's sort of evolved and uh, we, there's another offshoot of this, the, this plastic that's, because you know, the initial ones, um, they didn't fold very well. So the lenses we use now, they actually fold, they basically taco up. Um, so we can make like these small little incisions in the cornea, 2.4 millimeters, 2.7 millimeters. Um, and the lens sort of circles into this little taco and you can actually inject it through. And then once it goes inside, then it sort of opens up, um, fills, the, it fills where that old lens used to be. Um, and now you can see. Oh my goodness. Okay. Wow. <laughs> I just, I adore vision so much. And as we were saying at the beginning of the episode, it's such an important aspect to sentience, to awareness, to consciousness. Mm -hmm. As we immerse ourselves in these creations, the vision component in this three space with one time is so critical. And it it is the top sense in many ways, the top way for us to understand our environment and the other agents in it and well and so much yeah. of connection right it's so much of connection right like we are we are social creatures right we're social creatures and and so much of communication being nonverbal, right uh, all these cues, visual cues, you know, how someone feels about you, yes. facial expression, yes. you know, all these things that, that, that are, uh, you know, how, how individuals, they bond with each other, how, you know, kids bond with parents, um, you know, friends bond with each other, families keep in touch, you know, there, there's so many of these aspects of, you know, human life or communities that, that are dependent on us being able to, to, to see and to perceive. Yes. Now, are we correct to say that on the most exterior, so the furthest on the left in these images, mm -hmm. that is the cornea, the cornea 
Yes. Is the what appears to be maybe a couple like a hundred or maybe a couple thousand cell depth like on average about 550 microns 550 microns yeah. give or take yeah so so cornea being so the frontmost part on the AI that you can see there so so like you if you look at like your your colors so I can see like your eyes are kind of hazel right yeah um, if you were to poke yourself in the eye you wouldn't actually hit the colored part you hit your cornea first cornea first um, and yeah. uh, so the cornea is going to be so the two main refractive powers for the eye right so when somebody is nearsighted somebody's farsighted although in astigmatism those are things that are all interplays between the lens and the cornea and so those are the two things that are that are going to be refracting and focusing light to land on your retina so you can see and the iris is also like a, a muscle yeah, there, there are some muscles in the iris, but you don't really the the muscles that are responsible for using the lens is a different muscle. So there's actually you can see on the little picture there. Yeah. So if you look at the lens, there's a bunch of these like little those little fibrils thing. They're, they're called zonules. So those go to the ciliary body. So that that's actually so while there are muscles within the iris, there's actually a muscle called the ciliary body that sits around the lens. So when I you know, look at you and then I look over to take a look at my watch, right? That ciliary body is contracting and that's going to allow the lens inside my eye to swell. So in the same way that when you take, uh, you look with like a magnifying glass, yeah. that's, that's basically what you, the lens inside of your eye is doing. So that that's called accommodation. So the ability yes, to yes. accommodate. Accommodation. And dynamicism. Uh, yeah. Right, so the dynamic process, you start to lose it in and around your 40s. So, uh, so the, the, uh, the magic, uh, or at least the technical name for that is presbyopia. Presbyopia. Right, so yeah. that's, uh, you know, when you look at, um, so like my, you know, my dad has these reading glasses. He just kind of like hangs out on his nose. Um, and that, so ba that's basically what he's doing is he's creating that accommodation. So, you know, when he looks at something across, um, and, but he needs a little bit of that extra power. Well, he lost some of that accommodation. So now he looks through that little lens that's sitting out on the out on the nose so now you know when you look at your watch it comes into focus so that's why all these plays that we do you know cataract surgery with the lens inside the eye uh, refractive surgery on the cornea all those things are, are changing where these light beams are landing so you know if you're if you're nearsighted so myopia means that the light beams are landing in front of the retina so they actually land inside of the eye um, if you're hyperopic, so it's farsighted, the light beams are actually landing behind the retina. So mm. this is all optics, right? Yeah, and, yeah. and what we're what we're basically, you know, manipulating with uh, this new lens that I put inside for cataract surgery, the resurfacing on the cornea, we're actually changing how those light beams come together. So if you're you're myopic, we can actually change the light beams land a little bit further back. So if those light beams land a little bit further back, now you can see clearly. Yeah, yeah. So r r the refractive elements are cornea, lens, and small amount of the iris. In it doesn't not, do a ton. Not refractive, more the muscle contract. So it's like the iris can act a little bit more like an aperture in a sense. Yes. Yeah. Because I've noticed that there's many of these really brilliant scientific illustrations of the the uh, the pupil right now under these intense lights being mm -hmm. very very small, mm -hmm. and then once we turn off the lights, it's so cool how the Opens dynamicism up. and it mm -hmm. looks like it's like that muscle of that iris that almost mm -hmm. lets mm -hmm. the pupil open up right. under the darker to take in more light in the darker environments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are like some of the coolest like child science museum experiments to have kids undergo. That's amazing, right? You, yeah. you don't think about any of this stuff. It just does yeah. it on its own. Yeah. So um, now the cornea and the lens have most of the refractive components. So then the cornea as we talk about cataracts, it looks as though we're talking about the lens and not the cornea. So then mm -hmm. most of the time, the cornea is fairly okay 
up through the later parts of life. It's the lens itself mm-hmm. that gets most of the issue. Typically, yeah. I mean, there's all sorts of problems that can happen with, um, and uh, so I do corneal transplants as well. So, you know, the, the there's all sorts of issues that can develop with the cornea. If you have, you know, trauma, you get some scar, you know, right now, now you've got these refractive beams that are supposed to be coming in, but there's a scar on a certain part of the cornea. So that's going to end up distorting the image. It sometimes gives you, you know, it sometimes impacts the vision. You know, if the scar is right in the middle, you can't see through it at all. So, you know, what do we do? We can do corneal transplant, basically punch out that part of the cornea, put in a new cornea. Um, it's yeah. like changing out the windshield on the car. Yeah. Um, so, but I, I'd say for, if we're speaking sort of in general terms, yeah. you know, cataracts happen to basically everybody who lives long enough. Um, so, you know, that, that's a, an almost expected age related change. Um, cornea is more so, uh, it, it's a typically end up doing just fine. Now is the material that's used in the cornea replacement a similar material that's used in the lens replacement or different mm-hmm. no different material uh, so so corneal trans so transplants are all donor tissue donor tissue right so when you you know you look at your driver's license and your yeah. organ donor um that's uh that's where we get it whoa so all all of the c- can you use all of the just the cornea c- yeah. but can you use all of the the can you use parts of the cornea that are also outside of the just um so does the cornea also wrap around beyond the iris no just so at, at that so basically the point at which you see the white part of the eye that's called the scale, white, sclera 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 yeah. the white part of the eye right. but is that also the white part of the eye on the exterior is called the sclera as well is that not still the cornea that's wrapping even no, around? So, so oh, cornea okay. is only sitting over the iris. Only sitting over the iris. Right. Okay. So you see how on the image there's like a little bit of a dome. That dome is it. Right. The dome is the cornea. Then what's, be, what's outside of the cornea? What's that like th- very thin layer outside of the cornea? So over top of the sclera is the conjunctiva. So that... What is it? The what? The, the conjunctiva. The conjunctiva? Yeah. So like when you get pink eye. Ah. Right. So pink eye, uh, you know, the fancy name for that is conjunctivitis. Conjunctivitis. Uh, right. So uh, inflammation, uh, right. Conjunctiva, itis, inflammation. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I'm, I was curious about that as well because of that exterior most layer. Because you said we poke the cornea, mm-hmm. but then technically we first hit the what is it the con- the conjun- so conjunctiva doesn't grow over the cornea oh so or, it only, or at least you don't want it to oh so it no. only is over outside. over the sclera yeah, yeah, yeah oh so then technically in this image mm-hmm. that the the cornea itself potentially shouldn't shouldn't have that that exterior most layer over it it doesn't yeah it doesn't yeah so the yeah. conjunctiva ends at the start of the cornea. Okay, yeah. Okay, see, yeah. that's what... Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah. Okay, cool. Maybe they're just, yeah, illustrating it here this way. Okay, cool. Okay, so there's that. <laughs> and then now you said that within... This stuff. This stuff's me so fascinating, so I'll, I'll unpack this. Me too. Yeah, as you as yeah. you were saying, actually, you first said this, and I kind of tabled it in, in my mind. I, I knew I wanted to come back to it, which is... Now, what exactly is the deterioration that is occurring in the lens itself? Is that a a cellular malfunctioning that so, so yeah. it's thought to be related to collagen fibers so so the collagen fibers um, in the lens are in a particular arrangement that allow light to pass through them, and if that al- arrangement changes yeah. then the light no longer passes through sort of in the same way like if you think about like sunglasses like yeah. right like how do sunglasses where it's like uh polarizing right so so all polarized lenses do is they're they're blocking light that goes through you know a per, in a particular arrangement and while letting other light through Right. So if you have, you know, polarized lenses that look like this, light beams that go this way will pass and they'll pass through and they'll keep going. But light beams that are going this way will hit against this and they won't go through. Now, is the 
way that we're aiming to investigate this by taking the diseased lenses and then bringing them under high powered microscopy in order to identify that it's a collagen fiber yeah i uh there's people smarter than me that, that i got, love that, this that, stuff that, that got okay it. alex is going to uh, get but, but these you're... people on our program so we can <laughs> talk to them yeah yeah <laughs> Uh, but uh, but they are around, yeah, and they've got they've got fancy tools and microscopes, and uh, and they wrote the books that I read. Yeah, yeah, and, totally, totally. Uh, I, I love I was fascinating by stuff like this. Is, yeah. I'm also fascinated by seeing if there's a way to. We talked at the very beginning as the first principle of like retaining 18 year old youthful homeostatic capacity of the eye as sort of the first principle and like my one of my thoughts would be like well what interventions do i need just like we do with our cars and with our jet engines we have all these sensor suites that are all over them but with our health we don't actually do a a more you know i use this this image a lot which is from chapter six of high level perception called AI coach. And it's just like, we don't have this constant data visualization of our biometrics, because if we did, we could tweak our health at even the cellular level, maybe even at the metabolomic level that could put us back in balance which then prevents the development of a pathology i love stuff like this and i would wonder what would be required for us to keep a 18 year old even like potentially 2015 vision when I'm 28, 38, 48, 58, 68, etc. cetera. And like, what would those interventions potentially look like when I'm, you know, like, like bringing a car in and you get your oil changed and your, and the tires are rotated and the, maybe you change the serpentine belt, all these different aspects, which are all changing as we move to electric vehicles, which is hilarious. <laughs> But a lot, a lot of it is at least. Uh, but there's over there software updates. There's a lot of other things that happen with those. But still, in this case, it would be like, how can we potentially make our healthcare system more around that principle rather than addressing the pathology when it happens when we're, in this case, approximately, you know, 60 or, or 70 years old? You know, I if I were to address it on a on a big scale, I would tell you that as a general principle, um, you know, we address the pathology because we can address the pathology, right? You know, because if you think about how you structure the study, right? Like how you know we there there is a limited amount of time. There's a limited amount of funding. There's a limited amount of patience, right? You know, what is the question, right? You must have your hypothesis, right? So, and then once you have all of those things, you also have to have, you know, the statistical power to make a, an assertion about something, right? So, you know, if you can't, how big of a study would you have to have if you were just going to bring people in off the street and follow them for 50 years, right? To see, right? You, you know, the, the, the logistics of, of doing some of that stuff um, is, it just becomes impractical, right? So, so what can we do? You know, we can take a disease state um, and look for patterns, Right. Look for correlations. Look for, um, you know, macular degeneration more common in smokers. Right. So what do we say? If you start to develop macular de degeneration, stop smoking. 
right? Heart disease, same thing. You know, that, that's kind of what we, what, what medicine as a whole has been able to, to sort of play back from the, the subset of individuals that got the disorder. Because, you know, because uh, ultimately, if you were to run through the population as a whole, most people, you know, have, most people end up being relatively healthy. Right? And, you know, as you have a, you know, a subset of the population that develops some sort of a particular ailment, um, you know, the, you have to, you know, structure it in a way to where you can, you can study this. Um, so, you know, I think I can tell you, you know, a question that I get asked from, from friends of mine a lot is the, uh, the blue blockers. Right. Yeah. You know that. Uh, and I and, I, and it comes up a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, I have, uh, I, have a, I have a bunch of friends, you know, you, you doc, doctors as well. You know, one of my good friends um, who's a neurosurgeon um, was actually just texting me the other day asking, you know, should I get some blue blockers? Um, and uh, and I sent her the the NIH study um, that, you know, that that says that I can't comment. Right, you know, could do do blue blockers do anything? Um, maybe, I mean, you know, but I can tell you that there's no, I don't know of any published data that says that it does something. This is so, yeah, you're right that yeah. it's really important to do these in these randomized controlled trials to respect the scientific method and yeah. its integrity. I completely agree with you there. I also realize that a lot of these things are very intuitive, like mm -hmm. in the sense like a lot of us, especially in a very generic sense, we grew up uh, over biological evolution with the sun. So mm -hmm. there's a circadian rhythm. Mm -hmm. sure. And so there's that is generically speaking. And then in the case of potentially this youthful homeostatic capacity, it's just something like an 18 year old and their ability to bounce back from an injury and their speed at which their cells rejuvenate and their body heals uh, is just incredibly quick versus even being in your later 20s or later 30s, you already have a slowed down pace. And so we kind of know, in a sense, intuitively, the sort of idea of bioenergetics in terms of the mitochondria's ability to turn that glucose into ATP and power our body. We know the aspects of our, of our exposomics, and that's a whole new emerging field, which is fascinating, which is the way that the environment affects the, the genomics and the, the actual body, the organism, the creature itself. There's all of these sort of emerging fields that are are trying to answer the questions in a scientific method yet intuitively we know that there's a balanced state there's a state of equilibrium that the even through feedback like the the pancreas and the blood sugar homeostasis as well, mm -hmm. secreting insulin or glucagon. There's all of these sort of processes that what is the optimal like 18 year old state of the entire biometric of the body? And first that, and then second, how do we make the interventions beyond that sort of 18 year old peak state, including things like, the entire health of the eye to especially as we go into the like your friends pinging you what about blue light or like we just talked about a little bit earlier like these devices themselves because they're so close and like you said then there's the computers and we're entering into the virtual reality era as well and so we have to we have to like i've even heard you know the there are some ophthalmologists that have talked about sort of these cycles that in, when you when you are looking at a device to basically take a, a short period of time, mm -hmm. maybe just a minute or two every half hour or whatever, to just go look at like a tree that's really far away from you and just hone in and focus on that. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of, in a sense, you're working that focal point from something that's really close to something that's really far. It's like doing 
well, by doing that, right, what you're doing is you're relaxing that little muscle inside your eye, right? And so there's that, that little ciliary body that's working over time um, in order for you to stay focused at things up close. You know, how do you relax your ciliary body? You look at something far away and you let it relax. Yeah. So some, you know, eye, eye fatigue, um, you know, eye strain, a lot of that, uh, you know, the theory on that being related to, you know, you working on that tiny, tiny little ciliary body for 15 hours a day. Right? And if you look at it on, a, you know, on a, a long term scale, right, you know, when you are scouring the savanna, right, as society has changed, as the needs have changed, yes. right, yes, you know, yes. our, our ciliary body, um, you know, that may have been very beneficial, uh, you know, out in out in the savanna, uh, you know, looking for food, running from predators, uh, you know, it, I'm not sure if it was built for the, the nine to five office job. Yeah. And that also interplays really deeply with what we were talking about before we started, which was that back in the day of those days, especially in our early biological evolution, if you had a scenario of being born with ailment of the eye, the likelihood that you would be preyed on would be very high. Mm -hmm. um, and then we solved that with glasses. That was kind of one of the big corrections was optics and glasses, which was very interesting. Mm -hmm. But now, like we talked about, we are really becoming gods. And it's really beautiful because I love the idea of thinking about that surgical precision where you can walk us through this example with cataracts. So you said that there's a very small sort of incision that occurs and the lens itself is the lens with cataracts is taken out and then there's this the modern day technology is a little taco roll up of it and then having that injected and it naturally unfolding let's talk about that surgical process let's talk about the material that that is made of let's talk about who manufactures it let's talk about how so, much this costs let's talk about all this so you know it, one of the things i love about um you know the art of medicine um is some of the history of medicine right um you know that whole saying about you don't know where you're going until you know where you came from yeah, um yeah. and you know so so if you want to talk about to, that to, has a very profound spiritual meaning as right. well yeah go ahead the uh to, to circle back on the, the innovation spirit. Uh, so, you know, modern day cataract surgery uh, w was pioneered by a guy, uh, Charles Kelman in like the seventies. Um, and, you know, surgery before what the current technique was, um, you know, there were these big incisions you used to take out. Uh, I mean, first you go way back, 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 um, you know, original cataract surgery was, uh, was couching. I don't know if you've heard that term before. No, um, what is couching? So, so couching um, was basically sticking a needle in the eye and taking that cataract and then just pushing it out of the way. Like, right, so no lens, you know, it was just moving this cataract out of the way. Um, so as you can imagine, uh, it, it didn't work great. <laughs> you know, it didn't work great because now you don't have a lens in the eye. You've got a lens kind of dangling around somewhere else. High rates of infection, inflammation, all sorts of issues. Um, and, but, you know, once upon a time, you know, that that's, that's what you had, right? So, you know, then you get to a point where you start taking these lenses out whole, um, so it used to, it was called extra cap where basically you'd take the entire lens out. Um, and, uh, and, and this guy, so, so Dr. Kelman, um, discovered the current technique, which is called phaco emulsification, where we're actually using a little ultrasound probe. Um, so you go in through this incision and you're using a little ultrasound probe to actually use sound waves to break up the cataract and bring and, and it comes out through this tubing. So that's what allows you to do it under the small incision. Um, but 
as you as you can imagine, when when Kelman first started uh, doing some of this, he was doing it like like in the basement of Columbia. You know, people thought he was crazy. Yeah. Um, you know, so so the community, right? The community yeah. as a whole thought he was nuts. They're like, what's this guy doing with his little ultrasound probe? Um, so you know, now what what's you know the 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 standard worldwide, right? Um, was was really you know pioneered by uh, by this guy who believed in uh, believed in this technique. So you know, it's um it's a little the bit ul- the ultrasound probe is still the yeah, that's what i do that yeah that's yeah. what i did last week yeah exactly you know i mean they i mean of course the 50 you know, the, years it's been improved yeah you know the yeah. technology has changed and the machines that we use but the very essence of how yeah. you're doing the surgery um you know was really started by this guy so uh, minor incision and then the ultrasound probe breaks up the lens right so you and then you use va- like kind of vacuum it out so you suck the, it out yeah so it's a combination so it's this probe um that you know is basically breaking things up in combination with with, sucking, with vacuum vacuuming. right with in combination with an irrigation so there's actually oh. like a tubing because you have to keep this area open right so oh, so the oh uh, yeah yeah right yeah. so you have to have like oh, a working space oh, the other graphic that we have the, the, the um, lens that yeah we yeah, put yeah, in, pull it, yeah pull up the lens pull up the lens um, so the, so as you go in, you, so you break up this cataract, you take this cataract out, it's coming out through this ultrasound probe and then you inject. So these little lenses, um, are foldable. So like I mentioned before, you know, this is a, uh, it's an offshoot of plastic. Okay. That, uh, that the, uh, that the lenses are made out of. And they come in through this little injector, and the lens will kind of taco up in this little injector. You can go through this small, you know, right, like two and a half millimeter incision, yeah. um, and then you put it back in the place of where the old lens was, uh, and then you close things up. A lot of these surgeries were actually doing sutureless. Even you know, you can um, a lot of these incisions are self sealing the way that we make them. Um, so there's a particular technique where we're um, shelving and kind of beveling these uh, these incisions so they kind of close on their own. No sutures. Um, and uh, I mean, it's really, you know, current uh, cataract surgery technique. I mean, a, a lot of surgeons are doing this stuff 5, 10, 15 minutes, something like that for a case. Um, 5, yeah. 10, 15 minutes total time yeah, for. Door, yeah, yeah. It, total, door, total. And, and am I asleep? Yeah, so you know, it's uh, so a lot of things are done kind of uh, kind of twilight. Um, you know, you're not really asleep, you're not really awake. A little bit of anesthesiology. Yeah, yeah, a little, yeah, yeah. And, you know, most people have you know either an anesthetist or an anesthesiologist there. So you know, people are comfortable. Anxiety is under good control. You yeah. know, if things are uncomfortable, we always kind of tweak things. And there's as we like need a to. mechanism that like keeps the eye. Yeah open yeah it's like that uh what's the the like hannibal uh um yeah there's like a little little eyelid holder eyelid holder Um, and i'm just awake the whole time while this is happening i mean you're 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 pseudo awake pseudo awake yeah Yeah, you're pseudo you said twilight yeah yeah Yeah, it's kind of twilight it's uh you know happy time yeah. Um, but you know, most uh, most patients we finish up with surgery, and and most common thing I hear is is that that's was it. it. That was yeah, it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. That's so interesting that it's at that pace now. And what's the cost of the operation now? Um, so, you know, honestly, the, the, the reimbursement ha- has been fluctuating. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, so, I mean, the, the surgeon fee is, I, you know, and, and this is where some of the, the, the business side of medicine, I'm still kind of learning myself, to be honest. Yeah. Um, you know, the, how it, it kind of gets split between the facility fee. So there's like a surgery center fee. Um, there's a surgeon fee uh, and, and all of that also gets varied there, there's a lot of uh, modifications on the surgery so you know sometimes we we do a stigmatism correction as a result you know it kind of bundled into this um, uh-huh. sometimes there's a laser used to do certain certain parts of the procedure called a femtosecond laser um, sometimes we're inserting lenses that, that are what are called multifocal lenses where you know they're giving you some of this accommodation back you get kind of a little bit of distance you get a little bit of near it's actually little rings that can get implanted um, into these lenses that'll different rings stand um, huh. end up focusing the light beams at different focal lengths um and so those are called multifocal lenses uh and uh that's Is this what you were talking about earlier with correcting myopia and other 
Um, to a degree, yeah, to yeah, degree. yeah, to, to okay, a degree. Okay. But but the accommodation is the part that you're kind of getting back with some of this technology. Yeah, I um, see. And, yeah, and yeah. all of these things end up, you know, chain. You know, the, there's a different cost that's associated with it each one. And and then would it be generally like out of pocket, like no insurance? Is this like a ten thousand dollar procedure or something, or like five thousand or something? Honestly, I wouldn't. We, we don't even know. Yeah. Who man. made who manufactures this? Do you know? Uh, yeah. So there's a couple big companies. Um, you know, there's a, a a big company called uh, AMO that was bought by Johnson and Johnson. AMO, um, so so J and J does uh, a lot of lenses now. Okay. Uh, Bosch and Loam is kind of in the game as well, and then okay. a, another company, uh, Alcon, um, that's owned by Novartis. So okay. those are kind of like the three the three big players, cool. if you will. There's a couple other um, other ones, but the uh, those are kind of the the I'd say the big three kind of lens manufacturers. I wonder if there's any public R&D that's available around what we're doing around like augmenting those that are healthy with lenses because I would be super interested to sort of see what happens in these next couple of decades with the miniaturization towards like the nanotech level of the incredible computational capacities that we now have and then adding them to these lenses and then getting them implemented into our eyes because if i can become superhuman that way i want to i mean it's uh it's probably doable you know i mean i i know um some people that you know not quite the um, you know, iRobot version, um, but you know there are. Uh, you know, I, I know that um, you know one of the the cornea guys actually up at at Stanford. Uh, one of his uh, projects that he's working on is a lens. You know, for patients that have you know corneal blindness. You know, this, this issue with the front of the eye for whatever reason. Um, implanting a lens that's actually like a little TV screen. Um, so instead of needing to see things from outside, you wear like some glasses, um, that have a camera that go to this little TV screen that's inside of your eye that your retina is then just looking directly at the TV screen. You don't actually, you don't even use the cornea. Um, it's using this little thing inside. So, um, so it's, uh, so people are working on it. It's, you know, I I think it's, you know, it's, it's an exciting space because, ophthalmology is high it, it's it's a high tech field you know yeah. we use we use lasers you know we use small instruments we use little lenses right um so you know yeah, I, I think cool. yeah. right so i think there's a lot of um there's a lot of opportunity for for innovation in the future and uh um i'm excited honestly to just be be on the start of it so you know to see where where the field goes as we go <laughs> i'm looking forward to the merging of that that nanotech component with that artificial general intelligence computational algorithmic capacity and then embedding that in the body in really smart and intelligent and light filled ways to avoid all of the malevolent scenarios that people paint as well in these pictures now is this lens are those arms to the lens there to make it stable in place? Mm-hmm. Okay. Just wanted to make sure that that was the case. Okay, cool. All right. And w- let's see. What were... Let me bring this with me. What were our... Our, our numbers again? So 3.6 million cataract procedures performed in the US and 20 million word of all okay can we just do a little bit of of math because if there's 3.6 million cataract procedures in the US this I think, year I think the next line actually does some of the math for you oh oh shit you're uh, yeah wait you're right uh, damn Good call, that, man. You're uh, on top of this. Yeah, you know that, I love uh, it. they like okay. to keep things keep things straightforward. In the U.S., there are approximately eighteen thousand ophthalmologists, of whom nine thousand perform 
surgery regularly. Thus, a typical surgeon might anticipate a surgical volume of 400 eyes per year. Whoa. So you said it takes 5 to 15 minutes to specifically do the cataract one in the modern day. And then you might have on a day, you might do three or five of these and... I mean, it varies. I mean, varies. Some 10, yeah. 15. In a day. In a day, yeah. Jeez. In a half day. In a half day, yeah. That's so I mean, crazy. Depending on... That is so nuts. Yeah, that there's... Do you have 15 people in a day that are like exposed at the eye level that you're coming in and healing a, a collagen fiber malfunction inside of their lens? Well, what's yeah. what's interesting is you know you go back to some of these older and fifteen unique. You have to be fifteen unique combinations of emotional intelligence and mm -hmm. art that has to come with that science mm -hmm. process. Just, yeah, yeah. Well, and that's uh, you know if you if you rewind back to what some of the old um, techniques used to be, uh, patients were admitted to the hospital for three days after cataract surgery once upon a time. Right, because it was big incision. There's all sorts of things that could go wrong. Um, so, so patients actually used to be hospitalized after cataract surgery. So, you know, the way that this has been revolutionized, you know, now most surgeries are being done in surgery centers. Right, they're not being done in hospitals. Um, so, you know, it's same day surgery. You come and you leave the same day. Um, you know, you're there for a couple hours. You get a little anesthesia. You hang out a little bit after. Make sure everything goes okay. You know, family. Um, you know, goes goes and gets brunch. Um, they come back and pick you up and uh and you go home so it's uh you know the 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 impact factor um is so high you know the uh because i remember so you know the, one of the first times that i was exposed to this was maybe like second year of med school um you know there's this guy uh you know we used to do these like lectures in med school where we uh we you know it, lunch lectures we'd have like lectures in the morning um and then someone would come and they'd give us a little lunch lunch lecture you get free lunch you sit down and, um i remember that uh i had a friend who asked me to go to this lecture uh and they were talking about a um so there's this guy that came back from nepal uh, and uh, his name is Mike Fielmeyer, so he was actually you know a mentor of mine. Uh, and and I remember you know sitting down for this lecture, and he's talking about how uh, you know he went to Nepal um, and went to this like remote village, and uh, over the course of like two three days, did something like hundred cataract surgeries, um, and had the video afterwards of him like taking the patches off all these people, um, and right it's this entire community, uh, all these patients, you know all these people who who couldn't see and now they can, um, wow. and you know they're crying, he's crying, yeah, yeah, everybody's yeah. crying. Yeah. Um, and, and I still, I still remember why. I mean, like, right, like this is now. I mean, it's not ten years. Yeah, coming up on right eight, yeah. eight years ago, something yeah, like that. Yeah. Um, and you know, I still remember like watching this and being like, "Wow, that's that's what I want to do." Yeah, you know, that's yeah. what you know that moment where you're like that. Yes. That is. Yes. Um, and I went and talked to him after. Um, and, and I yeah, was yeah. and I was like, you know, man, I uh, I want to do what you do. Um, and uh, and it was really special because he he totally took me in, you know. And uh, I actually went to Nepal. Um, so he set that's up right, like a rotation yeah. for me. Like I spent a month in Nepal. I've done some surgery in India. Um, so I've gotten a chance to to get kind of uh, uh, exposed to some of this stuff. Um, but I think it's you know the 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 impact factor. For for you know effort over outcome right for what you're able to sort of uh what you're able to do with the work uh i think is it, it's 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 really powerful that's a profound story and i'm surprised that it didn't come up in that first part when i talked to you about finding that north star because that's mm -hmm. so profound it's a really good example of of that when you provide some a service of value to to people especially with something as sensitive as their eye and their vision and you really bring it back to peak capacity that's that love and if it's like a hundred people that you, in a couple of days that you heal like that i mean that's that that sounds like equivalent level of like you know when 
the rock stars talk about filling the 50,000 seat stadium and performing well this sounds like another level of that in a sense yeah well yeah. and i can tell you that you know the 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 impact also has uh you know it's this ripple effect um you know because you know i have uh and, you know and this happens to me you know regularly where you know i've had you know some of these patients where you know let's say there's a family member who can't see right you know that you know, you know there, there's the international scale of like you know kids that can't go to school because now they have to work you know because their their mom or their grandma uh you know can't take care of themselves so someone needs to take care of them right um and you know it, that some of that happens uh you know same thing here in the u.s where you know you have uh, yeah. uh right you, you, this person needs a caregiver right because you know now they're not able to care for themselves so you know there there's this also the, this trickle down effect of you know patients where you know been able to do a surgery they have a great outcome they're able to now take care of themselves they get some of their own autonomy um but then there's that that next trickle down of you know oh well now their kids no longer have to take care of them because they can take care of themselves and the grandkids also don't have to take care of them so yeah. so right so you know how the freedom that that that's gives right. to that's the right. family that's huge. right not even just the individual just the, but the family the kids right. and their unique north star endeavors right, yeah. right. now yeah, they're yeah, able yeah. to to pursue what they want to pursue that's huge. right so yeah. so that impact right like you know what that's not right not even yeah. just what you were able to do for that one person and now you multiply that by a community Right. I mean, you know, the the amount of uh, of change that you're able to sort of institute with the, this relatively small, uh, small change. Uh, this one up the mall just right. coming to Nepal and healing right. 100 people in a village of their cataracts. And, right. and just like that, it's like a massive amount of flourishing that's unlocked. It's right. cool. Yeah, it's, it's like literally changing the world. That's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Right. I love that story. Right. That's a, such a rich story. Yeah. I love that one. Okay, so give us the percentage of cataracts and then we'll do contrast that with the percentage of your time that's also spent on LASIK and then we'll undergo the process of explanation of what that is. So how many of the people that you see throughout your year, what percentage of them are for cataracts? Um, so, I mean, my current situation, you know, I, um, so I do all the cataract surgery for, for the practice that I'm in. So, um, you know, the... I mean, you know, cataracts are still, you know, if you look at like, right, like, so this year, 3.6 million cataract procedures will be performed in the United States, um, you know, for a country of uh, 300 million people, right? So, so, you know, it's still relatively, you know, small number of patients, uh, you know, I get uh, one percent, one percent, yeah. Right. So, you know, I, obviously there's a, you know, selection bias for, you know, people that are getting sent in to see an ophthalmologist. So, you know, probably a larger percentage of that ends up being the situation for me. Um, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of other things that, that go on with, uh, with eyes, with vision, uh, you know, the uh, macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, you know, as diabetes, um, you know, runs rampant in the U.S. Yep. And, uh, you know, the, those numbers, uh, you know, continue to rise. Uh, you know, as diabetes is uncontrolled, people develop changes, new blood vessel growth inside the eyes, diabetic retinopathy, uh, macular degeneration as we live longer. Uh, you know, we know that macular degeneration is an age-related change, tends to run in families. Uh, so, you know, as some of these issues that start, um, you know, as life expectancy has gone up, there these are these are later in life uh, conditions. You know, it, but but I would actually say that a, a lot of you know, the, the joy that I get out of my work is that, you know, the nature of a lot of these problems happening later in life is that a lot of these patients, you know, are people that are relatively healthy otherwise, you know, right? So, so you know, you have... Yeah, that's, that's a good thing, yeah. As right? long as it's just that one thing, yeah. yeah so, but usually there's a lot more like you were describing with, there's likely some stuff happening with diabetes or hypertension or... Um, potentially the early formations of cancerous cells. There's all different types of, of it's a whole synthesis symbiosis mm -hmm. in the, in the body. And so 
it's almost like maybe if you heal the the lens in this case it could create some other downstream effects not only in the community but also in the body yeah right. of health yeah well be and now you know as you're able to see now you know like right like what, what do we do for for diabetes at least kind of first line stuff diet and exercise right so you know you you need to be able to see to do those things yeah right so you know there, there's there, there's so much of you know self-care um taking care of you know uh, watching your diet being able to have access to a good diet a lot of these things you know they they're all very they're they're intricately intricately tied yeah then so cataracts is probably more than LASIK for you right now. At the moment. So I'm, moment. I'm trained in LASIK, but um, you know, most, most of what I'm doing right now is cataract surgery. Okay. Now, let's unpack. Let's do stats, and then we'll do uh, on LASIK, and then we'll, do the, we'll walk you guys through a graphic that we have for you. So oh, one moment. I need to do a small little scheme converter reset. There we go. Now you'll see the you see this nice and highlighted. Okay. So 10 million Americans have had LASIK surgery since it was first approved by the FDA in 1999. Around 700,000 LASIK surgeries are done each year, which is down from a peak of 1.4 million in 2000. So 700,000 LASIK surgeries done each year, and the number was 3.6 million cataracts mm -hmm. done each year. Okay, so now LASIK is named after a pioneer of the field. Mm -hmm. Is it? Oh, I thought it was. No, if I'm... Uh, I thought one of them, I mean, is it not? <laughs> not that I know. Oh, I thought it was, I, I totally thought it was named after a, um, a pioneer uh, in the uh, field. You thought it was like a guy? It was Dr. Lasik? Well, well, especially mm -hmm. because, uh, well, let's see, because... <laughs> The eye surgery to correct vision in which a laser reshapes the inner cornea. Oh, a 1990s acronym mm -hmm. from Laser Assisted In Situ Keratomilusis. Keratomilius. Milius. <laughs> in situ. Yeah. But who's site? In know. situ. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. I didn't. I thought that there was. So there, in terms of founding. A pioneer there was was it a team um that's actually a good question you know the the first you know i know that um you know there are you know it, when I, i'm not sure who they totally credit with starting lasik um you know i i know that there there was a a handful of uh of guys at uh, mass Ioneer, um who i know were were kind of playing with the laser before you know back before the fda uh had approved things um but we we'd probably have to double check who who the official the official record okay um who the oh, official record they uh and then now let's pull up the the visual explanation of what is going on and have you unpack for us so the so if we run through a uh, our our little visual here which which I think does a nice job of illustrating kind of the different parts. So there's actually two lasers that are used. Um, so there's a uh, what was called a femtosecond laser, which is what's responsible for creating this flap. And then there's an eczema laser, which actually does the resurf resurfacing on the cornea. So if we look at, um, so if we think about our cornea, 
essentially the two parts of the procedure are creating the flap. So if we look at uh, kind of image number two here, you know, that's the flap creation. So you have one laser that's responsible for doing that. It kind of breaks up all these like little cells and you actually go, we go in manually and lift the flap. So um, this is the, this is the 500 micron, 550 micron. So 550 micron cornea, probably cornea. average flap size is like 110 microns. It's probably oh. so. So, oh, so it only gets mm -hmm. from the very like one fifth of the size mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. yeah. So we're it. resurfacing that 150 microns. So so we're taking lifting up that uh, 110 micron flap. Yep. And then the excimer laser is going to be the one that that that's that purple or I'm sorry the the green laser that we have there at number three where it's resurfacing that center of the cornea. So resurfacing yeah so it basically is is kind of be it's almost like a beating down of these cells to reshape how this cornea is going to look so you know if we if we have a cornea that's sitting something like this and we flatten it yeah yeah now it doesn't have as much refractive power yeah yeah as it doesn't have as much refractive power those light rays that are landing on on the retina now are going to sit are going to land a little bit further back so that's how we treat myopia so oh. if you're near nearsighted we actually flatten the cornea oh. right? versus hyperopia so farsightedness that those light rays are landing behind the retina so we want to bring them up so we actually need more power so the resurfacing is on the outside portion of the cornea so it actually has kind of this sort of effect where and it's increasing the power is it a similar laser that same laser yeah, that yeah. can do the hyperopia or the myopia it's, fix it's just a matter of where it's doing the treatment Right, so if it's doing the treatment in the middle, it'll ablate and it'll yeah, flatten yeah, that yeah, down. Yeah, yeah. If it's doing it on the outside, it'll ablate there, Ooh, and that oh, kind of gives you the so steepening effect. So fascinating. So, if uh, that story I told you earlier, where my far-sighted vision is deteriorating, would that then be a hyperopia? Myopia. Okay. Right. Right. So, oh, so, so I am nearsighted. Right. Most people are nearsighted. But, but then my farsightedness is bad, which means I have myopia. Mm -hmm. But then if I'm good farsighted, but I suck nearsighted, which you were describing with like your father or just aging parents in general, they would be hyperopic. And then, then it, that is usually corrected today in the most cost effective solution with the glasses to just put on and then just to like look at your smartphone or whatever or a document close to you there's one more wrinkle the uh, so so the so the 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 effect that happens with age this um you know this 40 plus change is presbyopia oh yeah that, presbyopia right I, the, there's so many opias yeah and what's there's that one all, again? all of the opias all the opias <laughs> um so so our our myopia right is so the name is it kind of says what you have yeah so if you're nearsighted that means you can see things up close right i'm nearsighted yeah. so then yeah. by definition if i'm nearsighted i can't see things far away yeah yeah right yeah. so so th this is my myopia hyperopia is i'm far sighted so now i can see the far away yeah but then i can't see the things Near. up close which is usually the older people neither and, yeah so, so most people are, are myopic so most yeah, people are okay. are nearsighted yeah okay, um, okay. though though the aging population change presbyopia oh, okay. it is that's actually that. the accommodation that starts to go away so let's say oh. so that that's the ability for me to look far away and yeah. things to be in focus and then look at my watch and things to be in so focus. so i'm already getting presbyopia in the sense of yeah so probably what's happening well, with, with that far sighted deterioration that i'm experiencing yeah yeah so probably what's happening oh, is you're becoming use. is becoming more myopic i'm becoming more myopic given my screen use probably yeah exactly yeah so actually planetarily we are collectively becoming more myopic given our screen use and, so and, I, and, that, almost, and that's well documented and that's well documented so almost mm -hmm. certainly people's far-sighted abilities are deteriorating extremely rapidly due to excessive phone and computer use that's fascinating and then one more time so presbyopia is the muscle 
So it's the loss of accommodation. Loss of accommodation, yeah. And, I, I love that word. Okay, right? accommodation. And, and the loss of accommodation is actually thought to be um, not because of the muscle, because but from a change in the lens where it loses its elasticity. It loses elasticity. Okay. So if you think okay. about this muscle okay. that you know constricts and this lens that's supposed to swell up, to give you more refractive power yeah as we start as it doesn't mm. swell up as much the accommodation yeah, right you, you then you lose that nearsightedness i see i see i see so the accommodation deterioration is another way to potentially reference part of the myopia because i i can't my my lens itself i can't access the same capacities in that lens to see far away not quite okay Okay. Yeah. I'm always I'm trying. I'm trying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, so if we think about it's um, switching, it's switching between something that's close and something that's far. So, so if I gave you some glasses, right, that were maybe, you know, if I, because you wear glasses or contacts now? No. Uh, nothing. Yeah. Well, I have no. worn occasionally switching between wearing glasses so, just right. to be able to try and like mess around with seeing things far away more easily Jeez. but it, it almost that whole aspect of c vision correction like that it almost there's something so like it takes away from the normal biological process in the sense of when you put on glasses to see something far away and you wear those glasses for two hours and then you take them off your normal vision itself feels in a strange sense worse mm -hmm. and so that was something that was very off-putting in that process i assume that that's something that happens well you, you yeah you kind of get used to the the new refractive change right so you know if i had to guess you know you're probably like a minus 150 or a minus two, something like that, sure, where, sure. you know, you have things that a distance are kind of fuzzy, but they're not bad enough to yeah. where it ends up, you know, really Hurting, impacting, driving and yeah, stuff impacting like your life too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, the reason why your accommodation is still intact is that if you have those glasses on, right, and you, you're now set up sort of for distance, uh, and then you look at your watch, you can still read it. That's the accommodation. Okay, I'm, I'm following now. Cool. Okay. Okay. And then the procedure for correction in LASIK is w in step two is a different laser takes that little 100 micron small flap mm -hmm. of the cornea. And then a, a second laser comes in to do either correction of of my, myopia mm -hmm. or or hyperopia which plus minus astigmatism oh and astigmatism so, yeah, so we can correct okay. astigmatism as well okay and then so so lasik is is mostly for either correcting myopia hyperopia or astigmatism it, that that's the, that's it that's it okay that's interesting it. so now but and then you put the flap back down. And then, yeah. And so, so then you that's, see here, so is that now, step four? So you see how, four? like, if you compare step two to step four, you see how it's kind of flatter? Oh. Right? Oh, I see. Oh, it literally flattens the... That, yeah. Is that flattening the cornea yeah. itself? Yeah. So this would be like a myopic correction, right? So you see oh. how, how the center of it is flatter? Yeah, yeah. Right? So yeah. so we resurfaced the cornea, it made it flatter, and then we go to five where we put that flat back down. Um, that's what I really like about this diagram is that you know this is obviously obviously exaggerated. You know the flattening aspect yeah, yeah, is yeah. not that's it's not that flat. Yeah, it's <laughs> right? hilarious. Right, that uh, it's so yeah, this funny. is like you know you can put like your coffee someone cup. Someone like on. looks at yeah. you on the yeah, side yeah, and right, like yeah, sees yeah. the flatness. I <laughs> know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's you uh, can't put yeah, a coffee cup. Yeah. On. yeah. <laughs> like right. Like I mean that's that's very that's, flat. That's funny. Yeah. It's um, exaggerated. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I see. Uh, That's interesting. But, uh, so it would bulge outward more if you um, were f doing hyperopia? Uh, theoretically, theoretically, you know, the, right. most of the flattening change is in the periphery. Oh, okay. Yeah. Got it, got it. Instead of smack dab there in the center. 
So it's fascinating, right? And I think, wow. you know, if you think about, you know, the first guys that thought, hey, why don't we laser, <laughs> why don't we laser this cornea? Um, I you know. know. You know, yeah. That's and, beautiful. And I remember, you know, even when I had, um, you what know. What were you the, getting corrected? So I was about a minus three. So I was myopic. So I was probably a little more nearsighted than you. Yeah. You know, okay. to where okay. uh, I needed to wear glasses full time. I couldn't drive without glasses. Oh, you so, couldn't even drive without glasses. Yeah, yeah. I had them on all the time. Oh, okay. Um, and then, and now, now, how does LASIK though, when you get that procedure mm -hmm. to correct you from minus three to zero to zero, mm -hmm. when that's happening, how does that not affect your nearsightedness? So you're trying to correct your farsightedness, mm -hmm. but not affect your nearsightedness. Because I still have accommodation. So the so the if you still have accommodation, which pretty much everybody does up until forty or so. So I so once I hit you know forty five or so, um, which is actually kind of one of the considerations. You know when you look at doing LASIK for someone who's forty. You know sometimes we have patients who come in who are forty, they're forty five. You know and they want to get out of the reading glasses. You know so that that's where the interplay of accommodation starts to come in. And you know and, and I I know some of my mentors. Um, you know, we have referred to to accommodation sort of as like the holy grail of ophthalmology. It is. You know? it sounds like it. Right. Yeah. In the sense that, you know, the to have that ability to see things far away and then see things up close. So that's what multifocal lenses kind of hit at. That. Right. But that's they're, superhuman. I love that. Right. Yeah. But they're not, um, you know, multifocal lenses aren't perfect. Um, so, you know, the 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 ability to really get you know that distance vision that 18 year old eyes yeah right? those 18 exactly. year old eyes back yeah um you know the technology gets a little bit closer every year um but we're still growing you know there's still room to grow and now when you get lasik how long does lasik take and how much does it approximately cost and are you put under anesthesia? So the uh, so LASIK takes um, you know, maybe fifteen minutes, twenty minutes, something like that. Wow, Similar. yeah, Pretty that's quick. crazy. Um, you know the uh, as far as the cost, you know, are you under? Are you under anesthesia? So I know some people that do it with nothing. With nothing. Um, I know some that do it. Um, so it's all, you know usually for LASIK, there's not anybody from anesthesia present. You know it ends up being um, kind of as like a procedure. So sometimes you give a little bit of like a sleepy pill where you know yeah. you're um, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah something like a Valium or something like that where you know you're a little awake, you're a little you know you, you, but you're relaxed right? and it's mostly kind of anti-anxiety procedure itself is, is pretty comfortable, you know, like it's, uh, you know, there's a couple of parts where maybe you feel a little suction, maybe you feel a little pressure. Um, yeah. and, uh, I, but, but for the most part, you know, it, it's not something that's too, too big of a deal from a comfort standpoint. Um, and, uh, for as far as cost goes, you know, things kind of vary region, part of the country. Um, it usually ends up being a couple thousand bucks a night. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really, really fascinated with the addition and augmentation of our eyes given our technological capacities as a species. So all LASIK does not touch the lens. Is that right? Correct. All LASIK is cornea. All cornea. Interesting. Did you think you were going to learn so much about eyes today? Bro, yeah. That's the whole <laughs> point of the show on Up the Ball. It's just the whole freaking point. That m m my mind's going to be continuously blown. Our audience's <laughs> mind's going to be continuously For sure. I, I, I adore eyes. Actually, the first time that we hung out, I told you how fascinating it was that Andrew Huberman was actually the one that taught me that the eyes are the eyes are part of the nervous system. Yeah, they're the I remember you telling me about they're that. They're the only part of the nervous system that just mm -hmm. protrudes out and like 
touches the, brain. the environment. The brain. the brain. It's the, the brain the protruding central out. central nervous system. Yeah. It's so fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah, see, I, I, I adore this type of stuff. And, and it's such a cool way to, like, augment this central nervous system, the brain, from something that we can just, from the exterior, just, like, right here. That's it's right there. Yeah, I, I love that. Mm-hmm. And eyes are also fascinating because they're the, quote, like, gateways to the soul. Mm-hmm. And so then there's that aspect to it as well. That's a whole other layer. That's a romantic layer. Yeah. That's the bounce. <laughs> yeah, that's that layer. <laughs> so, yeah, I have so many other interesting questions about this that I'll try and I'll try and power try and power through um, them here. Um, Is there a, are you aware of any sort of reasons for the differences in the colorations of the irises across the planet? Or is that a biological expression of the genomes of the different areas? Yeah, that's probably the best way I could describe it. Okay. It's just the thing. Yeah. Yeah, you know, there, there's there been some work uh, internationally on uh, surgically changing iris colors. Um, you know, they, and, and actual like little implants. Um, you know, the, the current, uh, at least for us, FD, for FDA approved stuff in the States, um, you know, there, there is a, uh, there is a company that does make an artificial iris, um, but it's not for cosmetic purposes. You know, if you had trauma, you've got like major issue kind of with the eyes. Some patients are actually born without an iris. Um, so you, know, you can get all kinds of glare, all sorts of issues kind of as a result of that. So, you know, there, there are some, you know, really good medical reasons to consider doing something like that. Um, you know, I, I've had to unfortunately, uh, manage some patients that have had, you know, artificial irises implanted internationally, um, that have come back with all sorts of problems with their eyes. Um, so, you know, yeah, I would say that, you know, where the technology is at the moment, um, I, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go down that road. Have you explored that limbal ring that's outside of the iris? Mm-hmm. Donald Hoffman had a bunch of interesting research that he was reciting in the case against reality, his recent book where he talked about the, the limbal rings relationship with biological mate selection. So mm-hmm. we, we identify we're in the bump wow wow <laughs> category now that um we we identify that humans with larger thicker limbal rings are perceived as healthier biologically as mates which i thought was very interesting yeah, I uh, I would say we're we're dabbling out of my uh, my expertise. The limbal uh, rings, uh, and and then there's the whole field of Richard Dawkins calls this the extended phenotype, which is like the way that we portray ourselves in the internet sphere. Mm-hmm. And so it's fascinating because people will take. Of course, we are familiar with the phenomenons of people that take their photos and then into photoshop or any editing we, software that then i mean we live in los angeles no, nobody does that blemishes no, what, what and, are you oh, yeah, what are you talking about yeah, what are you talking about but can you <laughs> but isn't that interesting you can increase the limbal ring thickness and then become more attractive that way so there's all these sort of hacks that can be leveraged in this extended phenotype era that we're now the instagram game yeah bro that <laughs> upping it's actually that's fucking nuts like dude upping the quote you know gram or the extended phenotype in general is super closely related to mate 
selection now, mm. which is insanely fascinating. Um, okay, so we got through a bunch of that. Um, yeah, we got through a lot of the good stuff that I wanted to get through. Um, one of the things that is we've been touching on this kind of throughout, but it's like something that's really near and dear to my heart in many ways is the sort of like that fresh, like not only the fresh 450 ophthalmologists in the United States that come into the scene every year, but even, you know, at a youthful space at you know age 18 or whenever the young person is getting interested in when they have that profound moment like what you shared that i would love to sort of see a the healthcare industrial complex has a lot of perverse incentives especially in the pharmaceutical industry and especially in the insurance game and approximately 20% of the USA GDP is tied up in healthcare. And it's kind of crazy that the idea of a, a physician that is not funneled immediately into Kaiser to earn three or $400,000 a year to pay off their student loans can potentially take on a bigger risk. I love this idea. Take on an, a bigger risk after already taking on a good amount of risk and become like create more physician entrepreneurship even from that age of 18 onward. There there's both the sort of niceness to the systematization of the healthcare industry where you can ensure that there's like an MCAT that has to be passed and there's a series of these tests and there's a and there's a lot of other processes with residencies and they sort of ensure that the physician is a general level of basic competency, which is great. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I love the idea of balancing that out with pursuing what it would be like for instead of the physician to enter into that mainstream, like vertically, vertically integrated uh, Kaiser system, who's now starting to get into education, which is kind of, yeah, which is kind of interesting taking the full stack. Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting to see if that more entrepreneur, you, you listed this earlier, the more entrepreneurial, the more tech, the more sort of Silicon Valley esque aspects to the, in healthcare industrial complex can potentially eradicate some of the perverse incentives and, you know, drain that dirty bathwater, but keep the golden baby um, and sort of add in that youthful homeostatic capacity retention perspective uh, rather than treating only the pathologies. How do you see that sort of forming in the next couple of decades? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think the there, there's a couple roads that you can walk, right? And there's a couple different paths. And I think, you know, as as things change, you know, the viability of each of those paths, um, you know, if it is is probably different in 2020, 2021, um, than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, yeah. um, you know, and, you know, as as things begin to shift, you know, it's, it's hard, um, you know, it, it's hard to have a crystal ball to know where it goes. But, you know, I can tell you that if, if we kind of group these into uh, a couple main camps, 
right? A couple of main camps. And I think this is, this is not just uh, ophthalmology, but, you know, medicine in general that, you know, you, you finish up with training and you can pursue the, the academic route, right? You know, you, you get a job with a big university um, and, you know, you pursue the, the academic road. Um, you know, if you don't pursue the academic road, there's some of these big um, healthcare systems um, that you've already sort of touched on. There's, uh, you know, California, there's, there's Kaiser, um, there's a number of these, you know, these big uh, kind of private healthcare systems that exist around the country. Um, and then there's, you know, door number three, which is, uh, you know, the, the true kind of private practice. And, you know, there's some, you know, big group private practices that are, you know, a bunch of a particular specialist um, that, you know, all of these, uh, you know, members within the group are stakeholders and, you know, are owners in this group. Um, and then there's, you know, the, the smaller scale, uh, even single provider. Right, single provider with their own private practice. Um, right, yep. and yep. and I think if you you break up those three big different camps, I love this. Yeah, you know, I, I think that you'll find you know people that are probably a good fit for each one. Right, you know, and and I think that you know as we because I I think it, it, it's funny as as I get older I find myself you know thinking you know, more, less in terms of good and bad, less in terms of right and wrong, um, but more in terms of fit, right? And, yeah. you know, I think, you know, we, we have our preferences, we have our tendencies, we know, you know, where, where we're comfortable and where we feel like we're best utilized. And I think that, you know, my hope uh, for, for myself and, you know, all of, uh, you know, the, the budding physicians coming out of training um, is just to know that and, and to kind of have that courage to pursue you know which one is right for you and right for your situation um, right because there's a different um, we all have a different appetite for risk um, you know we all have a different uh, desire to you know create versus be a part of something um, you know and and after going through all this medical training and you know meeting you know a, a lot of my friends are physicians some of them in ophthalmology some of them the, in, in other fields and I can tell you that I think you know if you end up in the wrong one of those baskets um, you know, you, you probably become very frustrated with, with, with your career, with the trajectory, with how things went, um, because the, the rules of engagement um, are different. You know, the rules of engagement um, and, you know, what you're able to do, how you're able um, to, to facilitate things for yourself and for your patients and what you're able to do. Um, you know, there's uh, all uh, in all of these different spheres. I, I think it's it's a, it's a different um, it's a different playing field. Um, so, you know, I, I think the main, the big important thing for, for the young physician, I think, is, is to have some of that, uh, you know, self-reflection on, you know, where, where am I best suited? Right. You know, where where does my skill set lie? Um, and, uh, you know, we, we kind of touched on a conversation earlier with, uh, with with Ray Dalio and some of this, you know, what uh, we talks about with Bridgewater of, you know, personality characteristics and tendencies of, you know, where can we take somebody and, and I, you know, ideally fit them in a situation to where they're kind of a fish in water. Right. Because then you're going to get maximum output yep. um, and, you know, particularly right. Happy physicians lead to happy patients, lead to good outcomes, yeah. um, you know, well documented that, you know, burnout and, uh, you know, you know, physician stress, all of these things lead to medical errors. They lead to, uh, you know, higher cost of higher health care costs. There's all sorts of issues from. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I think that some of that probably stems from being being in the wrong basket. Right. You know, not really being a, you know, kind of true yeah. and, and authentic to where yeah, yeah. where you belong. Um, so, you know, I think as the as medicine, you know, undoubtedly is is changing and, you know, you've alluded to, uh, you know, the, the, the insurance game has changed and, you know, what the uh, the terms are. Uh, are are different now than they were um, you know a lot of the the people that that trained me and a lot of you know the older physicians that that uh, as I went through medical training um, you know often remind <laughs> remind us that you know the the medical record system is different and you know, yes. EHR is different yes, and yes, yes. you know the check boxes are different and you know what um, what what things are uh, have changed over the years but you know I, I think 
we are where we are, right? You know, where we, we are where we are, you can't just scrap it, right, and start over. Um, so, you know, I, I think that as I, you know, reflecting kind of on my own goals, you know, as I'm just trying to structure where I fit in this system and where I think, you know, my skills are best suited uh, for my patients, but also, you know, my popula- my uh, my community and kind of the, the population in the whole uh, of where, how can you really maximize your own output? Um, that, that's that been a lot of my focus on, you know, how, how I structure my career moving forward. Yeah, I like how you focus on the word fit. And then I also like how you highlight all of the different options on the buffet. You have to know the options on the buffet. And then you have to know where you fit given like Dalio talks about that psychometric analysis that helps you understand that at a deeper level as well. Spot on. And to be inspired to drain the dirty bathwater of the perverse incentives and to step up and as an entrepreneur physician to come in and to architect the more prosperous, more well-being oriented medical infrastructures. That's a whole big challenge that people have to be willing to be inspired and motivated and have the right incentives to step into. And that's a big part of my ethos in the show is to make sure that we have that in place um, for the future. Then another sort of aspect that came up was the synthesis of the East and West, which had a lot to do with the modules that we were talking about, sort of those future modules in the physician process, because West should have East modules around holistic wellness and natural sort of modalities of, of healing. A lot of the current Western infrastructure is now starting to prescribe meditation and mindfulness and sort of like you indicated earlier the diet and nutrition being so fundamental sleep being so fundamental Mm -hmm. but yeah to be sovereign with your awareness your consciousness that very first principle that we were talking about when you create that pause so that you're not reactive but that rather you can slow down and like a jedi like a ninja with high emotional intelligence navigate the world of people's psyches. It creates a massive decrease in cortisol, a massive increase in peace and joy that you sort of butterfly effect out around you. And so the East in itself can also learn some of the Western principles. And so ultimately a synthesis is going to be what is called for and i think that's that's um that's what the greatest minds are is is they're like that and they see that from what i understand you know yeah what i've been meaning to tell you yes sir is um you know it's i i find it fascinating how because I've watched watched some of some of your other work, um, and and your your ability to swim in the deep end, so to say, um, with with people that do something day in and day out, right, um, is yeah, 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 uh, it, it's yeah. it, it's actually it, it's kind of fascinating, Thank you, um, and Thank uh, you. and and I really I you know I enjoy it, and I still remember even from the the, the first time that we met, um, thinking you know that guy doesn't know he's not an ophthalmologist (laughs) you know but uh but but i think that you know the level the high level uh, of conversation that we're able to have on a topic that you know i had to go to school for for a long time to be able to 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 conversate on um and uh you know the depth at which you're able to sort of swim at the same topic not just with me but you know i I know with a lot of the other the individuals that you've interviewed um it's uh it's special it's special it really is i'm ridiculously grateful for you recognizing me and that ability and for mentioning that that was very makes me feel very warm makes me feel very recognized very loved and appreciated i'm glad thank i mean you. it's earned thank you, know? you. it's earned thank you know, because you. these things don't come they, they don't come free you know they, uh, these things don't come yeah. free they it took a uh, like 2000 like 
2014 to maybe 2000 and like 16 slash 17, maybe like something like that of like really hardcore polymathy in the sciences specifically, like obsessive compulsive polymathy in the sciences to especially the explain like I'm five, like the sort of Carl Sagan, Neil deGrasse Tyson style of science communication Mm -hmm. of understanding those like fundamental units of science across the different disciplines like in biology it being the cell but then also in neuroscience the neuron and then the even the 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 periodic table and and especially in physics sort of understanding the scales of all the way from astrophysics all the way down to the quantum mechanics and sort of rather than that Bohr model, seeing it more like an electron cloud, which is so fascinating, right? There's all of these sort of um, these different ways of understanding at an explain like I'm five child level scales and the material physical world that if we do a better job at immersing kids into the virtual pedagogy of these sciences, they can really become autodidacts. And the information technology, thank goodness for being able to maybe jump on the, you know, Kirk's Gazette in a nutshell, which is a really good channel that animates a lot of these more cutting edge scientific and that, that, but that's what enables me. The fact that I, I took all that in it gives me the ability to now be able to swim in the deeper waters and the depths. Like, for example, we have a lot of people that come on the program that talk about blockchain and cryptocurrency and decentralization. And so to be able to sort of navigate what the space of cryptography and mathematics around that look like is similar in the sense of being able to navigate that depth, but then also to swim at it from a polymathic breadth as well and that's usually when the connections between the profound ideas comes but in this case it's really just like being a kid is so important and like knowing how to ask good questions Mm -hmm. about the process like being a kid like knowing that like i want to goo goo gaga for two hours straight about ophthalmology like i want to know the ins and outs of how to heal cataracts i want to know the ins and outs of healing the myopia hyperopia and astigmatism that occurs with lasik like i want to know i want to know it and i want to be aware of it because i know that sometimes it's even a simple and i know other people do as well but sometimes it's that simple knowing of that component to our physical reality that makes it makes you able to butterfly effect out that knowledge that you've integrated to other people that may not even know that it exists. And so some people may not know that these solutions to existing diseases that are developing with eyes exist and corrections even for augmentations for people that don't call it necessarily a disease, but now LASIK exists for corrections that make people feel really i mean you can probably say like after going from negative three to zero like you probably felt like a god um i mean it's yeah. it, to to wake up in the morning and just go and you, know, you wake up in the morning and uh you know i can tell you i i still uh my old scratched up glasses are like sitting in my living room um and i remember you know seeing trying to you know run around with these these glasses and you get like you know you see all these like little like scratches and things and uh you know you put contacts in you put them in take them out but i lost my contact solution i went on a trip i i, I forgot my buy i forgot the contact box um you know there, there's like so many of these like little nuisances um that are just gone you know now you just wake up and go um it's uh it, it's actually it, it's kind of crazy how um you know the the adaptation you know when when you look at you know how humans adapt 
uh, it almost feels like I've always been like this. You know? Wow. So there, there's something to think about, right? Yeah. You know, my entire life I was in glasses uh, up until, you know, five months ago, five, six months ago. That's when it happened. That's when your lace yeah, was. Yeah, yeah, about five, six months ago. And if you ask me now, it almost feels like I've always been like this. Bo- always been like this. That's so, so fascinating. And yeah, we all know that st- stereotypical archetype of the person that's carrying around their, their, contact lenses and solution and carrying case and like all that yeah. awesome which is so it's a pain man it's, yeah, it's a pain. can you imagine like a chimp that's you know having to yeah carry that around yeah, right. in like in the back like versus just yeah now like you described it's just such a beautiful wake up go right. like ready to go i love it and also it makes you a better it makes you better at navigating maybe sudden events as well because when you're maybe at so minus three was lack of far-sighted ability. Yeah, so I was so my reading, if I held something like maybe right here, that uh, that was about where I needed it to be to to be able to read. If it was like here, I couldn't make it out. So I oh, needed, it was that bad. Yeah. yeah so I oh, was that's like basically, really bad. Yeah, yeah, so I was like right here. I mean, we. I mean, I treat some patients that are like they can read things if they're like right here. Um, so. Oh, that's really bad. So is that like minus five or something? Yeah, even more. I mean, like you know, you get that's patient, so crazy, man. Minus goes to a bunch. You know, you get patients that's that so are like crazy. high high myopia, like minus twenty. That's a thing. What's um? What's the rating scale called? The optometrician rating scale. What's that called? Oh, like this, like uh, the minus plus thing. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I, uh, I mean, they, basically, they just number uh, the lenses. So, so basically, the way the numbering works, it, it's the so it, it all goes back to optics. Yeah. Right? So, if you so like a uh, a minus one um, or like you know this one die like the definite like this is, so the the larger question is like right like what is a diopter? So that's actually what these um, these numbers are. So minus one diopters, um, plus one diopter. Um, so a diopter is how, uh, so it's numbered by how much you can move a beam of light at one, me- uh, one meter. So right, so one diopter can move a beam of light one centimeter at one meter. And then two diopters is two centimeters at one meter and three diopters is three centimeters at one meter. So, so it, so that, so it's actually that that's the measurement of the mathematical sort of optics, uh, equivalent of what those diopters are doing. So that's why as the number goes up, it has more power. Mm -hmm. This is also sort of the process that is one undergoes as a patient when they walk in for all of their eye needs is that they go through a an usually an optometrist first is so, usually so, what you see. So there's a bunch. Uh, so if you look at like eye care providers in the United States. Uh, there's about it's somewhere eight, nine, ten to one or so optometrist ophthalmologists just by practicing providers in the country. Um, so you know if there's like fifteen thousand optometr or fifteen thousand uh, now, I think it said uh, ophthalmologists. Yeah, yeah it's uh, eighteen something. Yes, so the whatever, uh, depending yeah. on which ones are practicing, and you know there's like a lot of you know, we'll call it a range. You know, medicine loves range. So medicine loves range. Two hundred thousand. No, op- the, it, I think it's op- like one hundred twenty thousand, something like that. Oh. Oh, okay. That's still a lot. Yeah. So the yeah. Um, medicine loves so, ranges. Yeah. Yeah. Medicine yeah. Lo- loves ranges, and yeah. you know, it, it's funny that a lot of the the terminology, you know, I you know I incorporated into just you know the way that I talk now. You know, right? Yeah. You, 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 yeah. It, it's funny your your profession as it it molds into your personal life and how you converse with people. Yeah. And uh, you know, my family reminds me on kind of a regular basis that you know I I, I start uh, speaking in in vagities. You know, like uh, you know, med- oh, med- <laughs> the, yeah, the ranges, yeah, yeah, yeah the yeah. the range. You know, you yeah. uh, it's uh, you know, it, it, it's funny from a like a cultural standpoint, but um, you know, so if you so just you know, uh, 
eye care providers nationwide, right? You know, just by by sheer number, you know, if in an actuality, right, if you were to ask, uh, you know, the average person, what's the difference between an optometrist and ophthalmologist, um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure what they would tell you, but... Uh, we you should know. know by now that, so mm -hmm. the optometrist is usually the one that conducts the, the basic, more basic eye examinations themselves mm -hmm. and then also then makes the diagnostics of what potentially some of the developing pathologies are and then the ophthalmologist is the one that is practiced in the surgical procedures that then enable the correction of said pathologies yeah generally speaking is that about yeah i mean so there, there's two the two kind of main routes where you know optometrists are doing diagnosis of disease they're doing treatment of of some diseases um you know the the route is through optometry school um and uh prescription glasses uh, a lot of that stuff is done by optometrists whereas uh, ophthalmologists are actual medical doctors right so so they're mds that went through med school um and then kind a residency fellowship in some sort of field in ophthalmology so um you know depending on the state you know there uh there are some optom you know some states uh, they they where they draw the line of you know who does what uh and you know every state has like a little bit of a different rule on some of that but but for the most part you know ophthalmologists are you know they're they're surgeons they're doing uh you know kind of more advanced procedures where you're using lasers you're doing injections into eyes, you're, um, you know, surgical uh, management of things, you're suturing things, you're cutting things, you know, those, those are, those things are all done by ophthalmologists. Yeah, and that sort of enables the ophthalmologist to see, like you were indicating, a good amount of the patients in those you know, five to 15 minute cataract correction procedures, being able to get through 15 of those in a day has a lot to do with, uh, f with the strong team around you that enables that flow to happen. Well, and it, you know, it, it's important because, you know, the, the, when you look at healthcare, you know, as a system, right, you know, not every problem is a surgical problem. Right. So, you know, in in a perfect system, you know, if you had a surgical problem, you would go see a surgeon. If you had a medical problem, you would see someone who treats the medical problem if you needed, you know, if we're just sticking with the, you know, the ophthalmology or the, the kind of eye care um, modality, you know, there, there are all these different kind of players. And even within that, there, there's subspecialists, right? There's, there, there's corneal specialists, there's retina specialists, um, so there's oculoplastic specialists, right? So, 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 but, you know, patients don't necessarily come in, you know, with a sign that says, you know, I have a retina problem, yeah. you know, refer me to a retina specialist, specialist right? Yeah, yeah. So, so the, the system as a whole kind of needs a team in place. Um, in, in the same way, if you were to relate this to kind of general medicine, you know, there you're, there there are primary care providers, and then there's cardiologists, and then there's GI specialists. Yes, and, you know, yes, so yes. so in order for the system to kind of function as a whole, you know, you want your cardiologist taking care of your heart, but you know, I don't know if you want to ask your cardiologist about the best way to deal with your back pain, yeah. right? You know, yeah. you're there, you know, maybe there's another doctor that would be better suited exactly. for that. Exactly. Um, yeah. So as we, I, I think that in, in the team sort of approach, you know, shuffling patients through to get to the right provider for, you know, match the provider to the problem. Uh, I think that's, that, that's kind of what, what we're all trying to accomplish. Yeah. Yeah. I love the idea of a sweet, of both specialists and generalists that sort of not only assist in the optimal health and well-being of each person, but also in the health and well-being and prosperity of the planet itself. So that's going to be an important fusion that we have in our future. It already is in many ways like the departments in the United States are kind of like that in their own specialist regards. Mm -hmm. And then there's sort of that more generalist uh, executive functioning as well, which kind of is a little bit in a sense is kind of prefrontal 
also, which is kind of funny. Like, mm -hmm. there's uh, many components of brain functionality, and then there's sort of the executive functioning of the PFC. And yeah, oh, uh, I have two, three. I have three. We'll, we'll get through these. Um, they're exciting. They're exciting ones to to go through. Um, the first one is the avid sailing and surfing, which is dope. Yeah, I love it. It's like in the bio is is like Dr. Alex Knesevic is an ophthalmologist and avid sur sailor and surfer. That's like, and that's it. That's all you need to write there. And I was like, that's great. So, okay. So like, let's, if, if those are the only other two things. <laughs> all I'm, yeah. then, yeah. um, no, you know, I, I think the, um, you know, what, what's, you know, to circle back to the, the flow, pull up some of these, right. Aw the awesome pictures, right. Yeah. If we pull up, if, if we go to the, the, the flow concept, um, you know, so Mihaly, you know, actually talks about, uh, sailing being a high sort of flow activity, right? Where it's something that requires a lot of, uh, right? It requires training, it requires a, a, a certain skill set to be acquired. Yeah, that's right. Um, and then it requires, you know, for kind of rigid rules on how you execute on this skill set to achieve your goal. Um, and, you know, I, I think that, that, that sailing is able to kind of channel, you know, such a kind of primal almost kind of man versus wild thing, mm -hmm. you know, like it, it, if you go back to, you know, the, the, the Christopher Columbus days, right, of, you know, this, your opportunity to challenge, you know, your, yourself and your vessel um, and, you know, kind of what, what man was able to create and to build um, and to use that to challenge nature, uh, to, move, to move forward, to navigate these waters. Uh, yeah. yeah, right. I love that. That's great. That, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That, that's, um, that's so good. I think that's, you know, it, 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 there's a lot of joy that I get out of it. Um, yeah. But that's, uh, you know, I think there, there's a lot of parallels between uh, between sailing, between surfing, between surgery, um, you know, and I think, uh, you know, anybody who who kind of uh, pursue ha, has interest in some of these pursuits, I think would, would be able to uh, 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 kind of testify to some of that. Yeah, I love how you circle it back to flow. Yeah, for sure. And those are. The ocean is is really one of the biggest gifts of California, and in many ways, and the ocean is also a cornerstone in our biological evolution. And water is so fundamental, also to life here. And I adore the relationship that we strike with the ocean and surfing and sailing. And I like how I love how you tied that to flow. Then, good, good. Okay, I wanted on. I, I can always. T I, I can tell when like you, you've got an idea that you like, yeah. and, and you get like this like little. But you haven't said it yet. You know, you can, you can see the, uh, the 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 expression on your face before it even lands. It's like I, this is good. I, I know. I know this is a good one. Like <laughs> this is gonna be a good yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cute. I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah. I like how you're beginning to draw these like interviewer nuances. They're so funny. I love. I love how. You, I love how you're doing that. Well, it's it's a little bit of medicine, you know, because you study people. Exactly. Right? Yeah. You know, so that you're also training. you're you're acting as a as a mirror to the things that I normally don't get to self reflect on that much, and that's mm -hmm. really important and really mm -hmm. insightful. And that's usually what I do as the interviewer is I mirror for the guests to unpack. The, um, their flower, their essence. Um, the interviewer becomes the interviewee. Yeah, which has happened a couple times. Guests have asked to interview me afterward, and then we've done that, and that's been that's been really insightful. So, yeah, actually, could be interesting as we talk media strategy for. Um, this is the link is in the bio to 
Alex's Instagram, aka Dr. K. So it's harder for people to say Knisovic. So you yeah. just go by Dr. K to most of the patients. So yeah, it was a little bit of a joke. You know, I, I've got, um, you know, a lot of patients that come in. Uh, you know, I, I usually start things, uh, you know, you introduce yourself uh, as, as you should, you know, hello, my name's Dr. Knezovic, um, and I get a fair amount of Dr. What? Um, and, and I'm like, you know, people call me Dr. K for short. Um, so the, uh, so I ended up stealing that for the Instagram handle. I thought yeah. it'd be a, a funny little play. And then that's in the, the bio, go and give him a follow. He's got great posts and stories. And then we also have the YouTube channel. For Alex as well, he has a couple great interviews up on there that I highly w- recommend watching if you guys are interested in continuing the exploration of the subjects that he's been teaching us about. And he's also got a good kind of trailer video over there on the far right that is really solid and that is sort of a good, as we're talking about, you know, interviewing the interviewer it could be interesting to potentially see your content strategy unfold in the space like there's really there's not that many people that know how to teach really well in science communication especially about complex concepts like ophthalmology Mm -hmm. and also have the emotional intelligence to basically bring on other doctors and their specialties and interview them and stuff like that so there's a really great fit potentially for you in the media space which i'm really looking forward to seeing you blossom in it's gonna be it's gonna be super exciting really excited for that i appreciate it you know i i think it's um but i think i think it's important to follow and and we talk about this about following your passions um you know and and i think that we are we're multi-dimensional right nobody's just one thing um, so, you know, I think it's important as you, as you identify things that, that resonate for you, um, you know, ha- as you, you're able to identify things that you're passionate about, things that you care about, you know, that, that you have the, the courage to, to move on some of those. And, uh, you know, I think that as, uh, as physicians, you know, we get a lot of training on the job. Um, and while the job is important, and I think that uh, you know most physicians that go through training probably stick with uh, clinical medicine. You know, there's a lot of other ways that you can become involved in your community. You can make your contribution, uh, kind of the population as a, as a whole. Uh, and whether that is you know however that may fit, you know, be that fit for you, whether it's in research, um, whether it's in, you know, new drug development, new surgical technique development, uh, new device development, um, or in, in the media space where, you know, I think that, you know, physician involvement in media uh, is, you know, what used to be, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think even a couple years ago, um, you know, was a, a little bit of a faux pas, right? You know, you didn't really see doctors uh, on on TikTok, uh, and you know now you have you know there's these you know doctors dancing around yeah, uh, yeah. On, on TikTok, which is great. It's humanizing as well, which is great. Yeah, yeah I think it's I think it's important, you know, because it um, you know y- y- people I think sometimes you know forget that. Uh, y- you know, behind the white code and behind, you know, all this stuff, um, you know, the, the doctors are people just like you, you know? Yeah. Um, and you almost want a doctor that knows how to ebb and flow between the seriousness and the play, because mm-hmm. that's what gives your insight into their ability to go off scientific procedure into that art territory mm-hmm. and emotional intelligence as needed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that, you know, is uh, is extremely important to be able to kind of meet people where they're at, right? And uh, and and I think that, you know, as you you pursue, um, you know, your your unique ability, right? Your unique uh, sort of ethos of how you want to, you know, play out this thing. 
uh, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, the media space has been something that I've been enjoying and, uh, you know, I've done a, a handful of these and, and I'm not sure if I, if I've told you, you know, thank you for, for having me on here. You know, yeah, it yeah, is, you uh, did. yeah. Uh, you. It, 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 it's you. always a ton of fun to, to get together. Yeah, yeah. Always a ton of fun to get together and chat, but, yeah. um, you know, I think it's, it's a chance to, uh, t- a chance to scale a little bit because you know on, in, in the day job yep. you know you get the the one on one interaction yeah um, but uh, you know uh, with the informa- one to many yeah, yeah. that's right that's right, right. Yeah. you get you yeah. you you're able with information technology to touch such a greater uh, greater greater population uh, that's that, that's that's powerful. Yeah, even that little kind of like boop 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 breakdown of LASIK in thirty seconds or cataracts and. I think is super insightful for people and it's kind of a big part of the future, especially with immersion into more of the, those virtual um, reality pedagogies that we are talking about. I have, um, and I like how you talk about it, like a, like a diverse portfolio in a sense of abilities and like, you want to be able to be like that. That's really important. Yeah. Um, so that's a good sort of recommendation also to physicians. I like that a lot. So the two, the two last thoughts, one of them's uh, metaphysical and one of them is more uh, playful. The metaphysical one is what is the telos? What's the end state? What is the Godhead? where is our complex civilization like a swarm intelligence evolving towards what is the attractor that we're going towards (laughs) i I know i know how much you love this uh and i love it i I love it for you (laughs) um you know, it, it it's funny. We, uh, yeah, maybe you know the uh, the the medical folks. You know, they we, we get a little granular. You know, so the on some of the this open ended. I feel like uh, I feel like it's like you you like open the door to like this wild prairie <laughs> and you're like go you're free now <laughs> like, <laughs> like that uh, like go run away <laughs> like now you can now you can go run um, and, uh, and and I'm just like looking out the door like where where do you want me to go <laughs> you know <laughs> but I was kind of comfy in here you know I liked it here like you can close the door it's fine we don't have to go anywhere it's nice and warm in here you know. <laughs> Does that does that does that answer your question? (laughs) Oh, that's so great. That's so great. Yeah, the power of a question to sort of take us from that comfy, cozy, like individual to something that's a little bit more cosmic is really powerful and it can drive a, a deep amount of of feelings of awakening to the unity of all being in existence it can drive uh, awe and enlightenment and a lot of really important underrepresented s- traits in modernity that are also potentially the root of all of our maladies being that some of the people in the positions of the greatest power on the planet haven't undergone said augmentations in their being and so that's why the power of those questions is so rich what would what would you say would be an attractor have you heard of that conversation that i've had on the program and what i have in the high level perception where i talk about it being like the metaverse so like the synthesis of artificial general intelligence indistinguishable virtual realities and bio and neurotech like Neuralink all together in some metaverse. And so the idea being that in a couple of decades, we are immersing ourselves into these indistinguishable virtual worlds for 80 years at a time. And then we forget that we made those immersions into those virtual worlds. And then we realize that that's what this is. And so that would be sort of how potentially a 
one infinite creator, God source could continuously, eternally, or infinitely explore all possible phenomenology through this style of transcension going inward. What do you think about something like that? Being the attractor. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, or, or, I'll i even take this to a different analogy. You know, this this would be like, you know, like going in the pool um, and, uh, and then, and then swimming, swimming out, like, you know, like, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to take this ophthalmologist out in the deep end. Um, and, uh, and we're going to pull him out over here and like, you know, cause I, I'm like six, three, six, four, right. Let's pull him out just where he can't touch. Um, you know, just, just to where he can't touch. And then like, let's, and then let's leave him and watch him splash around a little bit. That, uh, <laughs> It's it's really meant to sort of like I thought your analogy was going to be something that's a good one. And then like if you're <laughs> swimming in the pool and then all of a sudden you, you know, you open the pool and it just opens up into the ocean, into like the middle of the ocean. Uh. You know, there's another sort of way to, to view that. But that's sort of the beauty of this, like, you know, when somebody becomes interested even in that question at a deeper level do you have thoughts around the attractor of what we're evolving towards i mean i think my um my hope you know would be that you know we're moving towards um and you know and and maybe this year ends up being uh you know a a jump start to some of that right where maybe this year as as everybody's you know, been forcibly removed from their standard life from, you know, business as usual is not usual anymore. Um, and, you know, maybe we are a little bit more intentional about how, how we treat each other, how we listen, um, you know, what our, what our intentions are for our family, for our neighbors, for our community. Uh, you know, maybe, you know, maybe things are able to, to come back in a way that, that is a little bit more uh, pro each other. Yeah, I like that a lot. Which is ultimately what self-realization does is you realize that you transcend the I other and you realize that unity, that oneness, and it when you get to such states of non-duality, you begin architecting everything that you do from that knowing. And that's why everything you do is of the highest morality at that point. You see sentience itself at a very macro level. And when you do that, you see it potentially as some sort of like a mind. And that's why I specifically like you know, like you talked about a moment ago, it's, it's not just the, that state of mirror consciousness on the program for the guest to shine and blossom and to navigate the breadths and depths of that, but it's also to try and distill the most profound realizations of the guests that I'm sponging up into these graphics and visuals. And in this case, it would be something like that one begins understanding sentience itself is it awareness and consciousness is it and if we think about it like a brain with the nerve endings themselves that sentience acts as nerve endings within its own creation and then we experience it phenomenologically and we sort of can potentially integral we can have an integration of the qualia like the summation of the experiences and that is just this one creation and so it's really important the the integration is like the integral in the sense of biologically speaking we are 99.9 percent genetically similar and the derivation, the derivative, the individuation is like the 0.1% genetic difference. That's like your unique gift or your unique North Star. So it's not just to say that all that exists is some unity ocean because that's a very, in a sense, a, a it desacralizes the beauty of the individual artistic expression. And so you have to 
you have to bring those two together, which is basically what this graphic that I wrap with is about, which is the, in chapter 10 on infinity, which is basically that synthesis. Humans find themselves as the portal. We are portals where on one side we live in that spiritual non-dual symphonic state and on the other side we live in this phys physical individual solo state. And the solo in the symphony is your unique instrument, your unique melody that you play, which is what you're doing. Ophthalmology is your unique instrument, your unique melody. And avid sailor and surfer. <laughs> yeah, so... That's, uh, I actually thought that was more spiritual. Yeah. Really? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, also the way you describe ophthalmology is spiritual because you describe it from a science merging with art perspective. You get it. Yeah, you get it in many ways. Last question is the silly question, which is what is your favorite food? <sighs> um, ooh, I wasn't ready for that one. What is my favorite food? Um, sushi? Might be sushi. Yeah, bro. It's so I just, good. I just had some sushi yesterday. Tell me more. Take, yeah, take that a... recency bias. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You just got, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How's that? I was like, what did you eat yesterday? Yeah. Sushi. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, my yeah. favorite. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, love takeout. Uh, I got a little spot, like maybe like three blocks from my place. Um, does great takeout, bento boxes, 25 bucks. Can't beat it. You know? What's your go to? sushi what's your favorite to pack inside and on top of the rolls um so i like the rolls you know, or are you sent are you nigiri and I, 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 sashimi guy i i don't quite do the sashimi i don't know i like the rice you know yeah. so so i do um while while you know I, I, as much as i would love to be like a purist right like drink your whiskey neat um eat your sushi sashimi only like right the uh, yeah. uh yeah. but you know the uh, uh i i typically do do nigiri you know i like the the salmon the yellow tail little eels good yeah um yeah. you know sure. it's uh it's good stuff yeah. yeah oh cool and then um i would also like to say that uh do you have a specific uh, additional like drink of choice or a uh, like a beverage of choice do you have one of those as well this is my first time walking into the beverage of choice the beverage area um, yeah. i i do i really drink a lot of coffee yeah coffee's the go-to yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know i do um coffee uh kombucha kombucha iced tea, iced tea. Yeah. yeah yeah, those yeah are good. that's like that that's like my trifecta what's your go-to on those three like what brand of coffee so i, yeah. I i've got like a nice little i actually get some of the uh you know you know bezos and and his and his amazonification yeah, right yeah. of the world yeah you know i get i get a shipment in on sundays yeah um and uh i get these like little uh the cold starbucks cold brew oh start those little morning. nitro cold brews yeah, yeah, so yeah i do the little, one without the one that's black black yeah yeah, me, yeah, yeah. likewise those nitro cold brews are solid yeah right yeah they're nice they're in the fridge you start the day with it yeah um you know a little kombucha with lunch a little iced tea after work uh, and uh, and we start that's again cool. tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, well, that's cool. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> wow. What a what an epic what an epic show. What an epic show. We made it. Yeah. And also the the coverage was excellent. Like the coverage of breadth. The breadth of it was excellent, but also we really got into those depths and I'm really glad that we had those visuals. They were super instrumental and it's quite obvious that you're well-versed and we needed to do this episode not only to highlight you and highlight the beauty of your unique flower blossoming, but also the field of ophthalmology in general is super important to highlight. Mm -hmm. You know, it's crazy to think that there's less than 20,000 ophthalmologists in the U.S. and that there's, you know, 3.6 million people that in the U.S. that are undergoing cataracts, surgeries every single year and 700,000 undergoing LASIK and like 
it really makes you sort of like especially when you understand more about perception and vision and it just makes you more in love with the eye just this a general conversation should make you more in love with the eye um well both this eye and the eye and um and it should also give us gratitude for the fact that we don't have um, that cataracts yet and that we should be grateful for that and that we should also build the tools and the strategies that enable us to um, retain that youthful homeostatic capacity for l l uh, prolonged periods of time, correct some of the perverse incentives in the industry, rock it into more physician entrepreneurship, merge science and art together. There were a lot of really critical yeah, takeaways and explorations okay. from the program. No, it's uh, yeah. I'm uh, I'm grateful to be a part of it. I really am. Thank you. And grateful for for sharing this with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in as well. We greatly appreciate you. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Let us know how you're feeling. Let us know how you understood some of the concepts that Alex was teaching. Just throw us some of your comments below and check out the links in the bio below both alex's instagram profile as well as his youtube page go and give him a follow go and give him a subscribe and follow up on the awesome content that he's posting there and also like the video subscribe if you haven't share the video with people that you think would this would resonate with with ophthalmology especially if you have loved ones that need to know more details about what exactly uh, is happening in that space of cataracts and LASIK and things like that. And also support the artists, entrepreneurs, spiritual leaders, scientists, entrepreneurs, engineers in your communities and around the world that you believe in. Support them and help them flourish. You can find all of our links in the bio below to simulation. You can help us continue executing all of our biggest dreams here as well and go and build the future everyone manifest your dreams into the world we love you very much thank you for tuning in thank you we'll see you soon peace